Test. Test, test. Test, test. Okay, I think we're good. I see that showing up. Does it sound, does it sound, heal me. Okay, that's that. Test, test, okay. There we go. Two minutes of tech difficulties, two minutes, okay. That's weird, that's weird. Sounds like usual, good. The first test I think should have sounded off because I think the first time you heard me was on the Yeti mic. So I pulled the backup mic out. Oh, that's so weird. Okay, let me delete off these extra. I tried to like, I cleaned up the computer this weekend. I cleaned up my apartment. And that's like, I cannot wait till I have everything all in one spot and I don't have to like redo things. Can you turn it up just a bit? This is as loud as it goes right here. Uh, is this pretty loud, Brad? How are we doing on, I might be able to do one thing to this. Let me check one thing real quick. Let me go to a filter on it. And let me see if I can um, apply a filter. I will be driving to Texas. I will be driving to Texas. Is it the gain? I don't want a noise gate. I think it's the gain, right? Let me go to gain. And let me go to gain. Okay, so. We'll probably Texas. Brian, Texas. Look at that. Okay, I added a gain of. Tell me, everyone, is this better or worse? Is this right here better or worse? How are we doing? Better or worse? Better or worse? Better or worse? How does that sound right there? Better or worse? Perfect. I like perfect right there. Okay, we added a gain of 1.5. I'll have to listen to this later and see how it sounds. But I added a gain. Awesome. Thank you so much. You know, there's. I don't know. I've like. <laughs> Driving to Texas is going to be fun. I've, I've like the last few days here. Um, you think the timing's a little bit off? No, that that is going to be harder to correct right here. Two seconds. I might be able to, because it should have my filter on this. No filters applied. Two seconds. Filters, four filters. No, this doesn't. I think I might be off by like um, just the tiniest of bits. And um, I can't remember how to. No, Brad, you should never say anything. <sighs> I figured that out. I did a bunch of testing. Color scaling, chroma, noise gate, color. Uh, let me look at one last thing right here. Cause that's like a, <laughs> no, how is it like barely noticeable? Like if I snap, yeah, it's going to, you're going to, never mind. I should not show you these things. That'll have to be corrected afterwards. Let me look at the filters one more time on this and then let's hop into class. Let's start. We'll get serious here. Don't look at Brian, this class, noise suppression, invert polarity, noise gate, compressor, limiter, expander, VS2. I don't know what the VS2 plugin is. There's a way, oh wait, here, wait, okay. Okay, wait, 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 found it, found it. Okay. Assuming it's the same, is it better now? How's it, how's it now? Because assuming it's the same, I found the option again to change that. Is this better now? Good, found that. So no lag, good. So yeah, it was, we're, it was point, if you're wondering, it was, uh, 2.22 seconds so sorry about that gotta gotta know everything in obs studios gotta know where all the lag controls are but i had i had changed it in all my test streams yeah because since i put the new mic in it was not i didn't even change mics i have no idea what's going on ah okay sorry for the sorry for the tech difficulties everyone sorry for the tech difficulties i can't wait till i no longer have to like move around this room and change things and don't have to worry about the studio having problems but so exciting times are coming one week from today i'll be in texas i know it's time for some logistic regression let's get serious here let's turn on some look we got music can you guys hear that oh it's the go xlr Ooh, because you guys can't hear that it's not even showing up i can hear music but you can't so it looks like the go xlr i don't want to reset it right now or lest who knows what will happen 
Maybe I'll try that between streams. Might be a bad idea, but it looks like um, because I was doing a bunch of cleaning up on the computer and I updated the computer, just trying to get the computer to be 100%. But let's not focus on that. Let's focus on the chapter six logistic regression. So with chapter six logistic regression, this is where a few people were emailing me this weekend and they were really confused about how to do this type of regression. This is a huge hint for your take home. We have to predict something like whether or not somebody is smoking. So did anyone see the question on the take home where you have to predict whether or not somebody is smoking? Who remembers that question on the take home? Does anybody remember that question on the take home? A single person. We'll see what people are saying in the chat. I'm making sure Streamlabs is up and running. Streamlabs is up and running. Yes. So that is logistic regression. What is the point of logistic regression? Can anyone explain to people in the chat for 100 points? How, what is the point of logistic regression? Why do we have logistic regression? What is the point of logistic regression? Like someone explained, like a good note you should have on logistic regression is what's the point of it? Why are we doing logistic regression? What's the difference? Why not just use regression? Like imagine, I love written test. Mila, 100% right there. <laughs> Mila is totally right. Mila got 100. It predicts a categorical variable. So this is the change. This is the immediate change you have to know about logistic. We talk about like regression versus logistic. Logistic predicts a categorical Y. And that's in Mila's answer right there. Mila's saying it predicts, that means it's doing the Y variable it's focusing on, a categorical variable. So that's going to be something like yes, no, or buy, sell, or smoking now, smoking never. So we need to know that it predicts a categorical Y. That is the most important thing about logistic. As I'm writing questions here and Alex is helping us out and I should have, I'll try to have a practice test posted and we will be doing the Kahoot on Wednesday. Remember we had that schedule from Friday posted. So try to follow the schedule, be working on the assignments, be working on the homework and be ready. So let's continue on. This is the point of logistic. Logistic is gonna focus in on a two level categorical variable. What's the max points rate? Thousand points. Let's do it. Thousand points. Thousand points. We've been up in like crazy. Good question, Ben. Hundred points, Ben, right there. So we have a two-level categorical Y with logistic, and it predicts the probability for each of these events occurring. So you can you can think about this. Like this is what they're using with things like the presidential election to see. You know, right now it's at least in America it's a two-party system. I'm not saying third parties don't exist, but it's like right now we have Trump, we have Biden. So when you think about this, you can use logistic regression. And this is what a lot of these models are doing. If you go to a really, one of my favorite sites, has anyone ever seen the site 538? Has anyone ever been to Nate Silver's site 538? I might be the only person in the world who goes there just because I like looking at numbers and data. But if you haven't been there, check it out. There's a bunch of numbers and data going over the election all the time. Yep, really good site on just like numbers and data and just looking at polling and electoral college, and you'll see the models, you'll see confidence intervals. You'll see many things we talk about in this class because we use a lot of the standard techniques that everyone uses when he builds like 95% confidence rolls. When he shows like the probability increasing or decreasing, he's using logistic regression. So I know it's, and it's, so, and it's done really well, a lot of great graphics on it. So go check it out, 538 Nate Silver. If you Google it, you'll see just, Tons of different things, tons of different polls, all that good stuff going on right here. So what is our goal with logistic? It's to predict a probability. We want to take something like whether or not someone will click on an ad on a web page and turn that into a probability. But what's the whole problem with clicking on an ad? Does everyone remember QQ straight enough, no outliers? Well, do you remember the trick we did just last class or two classes ago where we started looking into a categorical X, instead of treating it as like, we had like, you know, yes, no, or buy, sell, or things like that, what did we do? 100 points, what did we do with a categorical variable when it was an X? Does anyone remember what we did? What did we do with those categorical Xs? You can remember like what we called them, how we made them into quantitative. What did we do with categorical Xs? That was, that was the end of last week. We dealt with, give it a reference and set the other levels. Yep. So Brad's right, right there. We, we had a reference level like day of the week. The reference is Friday. Very easy test question right there. And then the indicators were the remaining six. So you set a reference level and then every other day was compared to it. 
and every reference level could take on the values of what or what. Every reference level could take on the values of what or what. It's pretty easy, pretty easy to think about how this works, because if you have four seasons of the year, fall becomes the reference level because it's the first alphabetical. And then these levels can only take on values of one or zero, James for 100 points right there, because ones or zeros, it's like it's either spring, fall, wait, it's either spring, summer, or winter. But if it's none of those, then it's fall. That's how reference level works, is that if it's not spring, if it's not summer, if it's not winter, it is fall. Reason being, it's just arbitrary, fall comes first. There's no like, oh, fall is the, the season we start school in. That's why it's first. No, it's just alphabetical. That's the way the program works. And I'm sure other programs could code it differently. We just like keeping like a consistent, like you'll know which will be the reference level when you look at your levels, you'll be like, oh, that's the first one alphabetical. But you could force one to be the reference. You could always compare reference levels as we do. Now we talk about the probability here. The probability is going to be based on the long term. So this is very, very important that you don't think of probability as like when you pick a number out of a bag or when you roll a dice. It's not like a fair dice. It's weird to think of this. It's like very subtle and it's like not that big of a deal, but it, it goes to a huge thing in statistics is that when we say a dice has a one sixth probability of rolling a number, or in this case, we have a one tenth probability of drawing a number out of a bag. We're saying in the long run, we're saying that if you were to examine this in the long run, you would observe this probability. Because when you roll a dice, you will either roll the number or you will not roll the number. So you can't say like, it happens one sixth of the time in that roll, or you can't say you get this number, you'll get this number one tenth in this observa observation we have here, but in the long run, and this is what we call the law of large numbers. So the law of large numbers states that in the long run, you will observe the true probability of an event. So you can see right here what happens. What percent of the time are we observing a seven drawn out of the bag? Well, if you notice the first few draws right here, what happened? Because this is running the, the probability. I know, right, Ben? It was like just like last month or so. Because at the start of this, we did not get sevens right here. What you're observing at the very start of this is the following. Not a seven, not a seven, boom, seven. All of a sudden, with only three draws, what's the probability in this moment right here? What is the probability directly in that moment? Right there. Who knows for 100 points, Ben, 100 points for remembering this from Stat 201. Brendan, you are totally right. And so Ben and Brendan will give them both points right there to be one third. And then it drops down to one fourth, one fifth. It jumps back up to two six, and it actually goes back up even higher. So what do we have right here in the long run? So what is the long run? A very long run. <laughs> we, we don't have to worry too much about like figuring out when the long run is. We can just say the law of our number states that in the long run, the probability of an event will be observed and it'll approach it in the long run. And Brennan's right that this is 10% because it's just a random number being drawn out of a bag. And since it would occur just theoretically 10% of the time, if we did a simulation, we would observe this. Simulation shows reality and we've done that. Here we are with people paying with a credit card and people are paying with a credit card 70% of the time. And what do we see? In the long run, we observe that. It's kind of like to say if you went to the, like if you worked as a waiter and you watched like two tables pay with credit cards, you're like, oh, everyone pays with credit cards. And all of a sudden people didn't. You're like, oh, nobody, wait, it's like 50%, it's like 40%. But after this is 100 trials, uh, that is 10,000 trials. And is that a million? That's a million trials right there. You are, you're, you are going to observe. And you'd be like, what if you don't? Well, then that's not the real probability because the law of large numbers states that with repeated trials, and I guess random trials, you can't say I'm gonna go on Friday nights and do trials because that might be a different sample, but with representative repeated trials, you will observe the probability of the event in the long run. So we've got that right here, law of large numbers. And why is this important? Because what are we predicting? What will we be predicting for the Y variable, a what? What will we be predicting for the Y variable with logistic regression? 100 points, everyone right here. Everyone can get this. 
you need to have this note that in logistic regression, we are predicting a blank for the y variable. What will be probability? Brad, first person right there. Brad gets 200, everyone else 100. Make sure to write down probability. That is a key thing to know that when we are doing logistic, we are predicting a probability for that y variable. That is so key. If you don't know that, you don't know what, you don't know what logistic is. Is that in logistic regression, we are predicting a probability for the y variable. Now I get sad here because and I probably use this joke. I'm thinking about it. The probability of me watching uh, Into the Spider Verse again is 100%. What does that mean? Can someone explain when Brian says the probability of me watching Into the Spider Verse is 100%? What does that mean? What does that mean? When I say something has 100% probability, it will occur. I will watch Into the Spider-Verse again. Such an awesome movie. Now, when I say the probability of me meeting Miles Morales, and I'm not saying when I, when I eventually buy a PS5 and I play the new Spider-Man game, but the probability of me meeting the real-life Miles Morales is zero. What am I saying? When I say the probability of me meeting the real-life Miles Morales, it'll never... Oh, you guys are dashing my dreams right there. <laughs> I used Deadpool for a while. Now, now we're using Spider Verse. Never gonna. Gosh, you guys are so mean in the chat today. <laughs> but I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You guys are like no, Brian. We thought you're being serious. <laughs> so with this right here, we have right here. Uh, just we can figure out whether an event occurs or an event does not occur, and simply these are complements of each other. So the probability of an event occurring. And the probability of an event not occurring are just compliments. Pretty easy to understand. Like either Brian meets Spider-Man or he'll never meet Spider-Man. It's like, okay, probability of him meeting Spider-Man is zero. The probability of him not meeting Spider-Man is 100%. So you can be like, I, it, is, it will occur that you will not meet Spider-Man. It won't occur that you will meet Spider-Man. So these events in and of themselves are compliments. This is compliment with an E, not compliment with an I if you're spelling it. Most people might not even notice. I didn't notice for the first year of Stat 201. And this one's like, that's spelled incorrectly. I was like, what? And then I looked at him and I was like, oh, it is. I don't know how to spell. So do not confuse. And this is a really great topic right here. I might even do, you know what we haven't done in a while? This would be a really good thing to do. Let's pull it up here. We're going to do it. You know what it's time for? Oh, it's the wrong screen for it. Will it do it? Let's find out the hard way. Can we pull up the stuff? You bet, Corbin. You know it. Here, we're going to find out. If it doesn't do the graphic, we're doing the graphic either way. We're going to do the graphic. You ready? Here, let's hit, let's hit the speedrun button. Let's do it. Hello, hello. Okay, new mic. Two seconds. Bah. Test, test, test. Okay, we're good to go. Okay, we should be good to go. My gosh, that's craziness. And look at look at the crazy arm we got on this right here. Because we haven't used this screen in a while and I've had to like every day. Oh no, what am I doing? <laughs> really? It's supposed to do well. Cool. There's the arm. <laughs> okay, let's do this. Here we go. Let's do a speed run. And we're back. 
muted speed runs pog right there i love it so pog champ let's do this let's do a speed run right here of talking about p values this is a speed run of p values so when it comes to p values in statistics the most important possible number to know is 0 0.05 0 0.05 is our cutoff for statistical significance. So it doesn't matter what you're talking about. If it is less than, like if the p-value is less than 0.05, statistically significant. So if it's less than 0.05, it is statistically significant. It does not matter what you're talking about. Now, in a moment, I'm gonna expand upon this because what does it mean for something to be statistically significant? Now, of course, if it's p-value of greater than or equal to 0.05, then right here we would have not statistically significant. So what in the world does this whole statistically significant mean? That's a very important thing for us to talk about. Statistical significance means that it's unlikely by random chance. So it means whatever we observed was unlikely by random chance, i.e. had a low probability. So with that right here, we have to think about our null hypothesis. And I think this can help people understand what we're doing. So remember, p-value, when it's low, just means our results are unlikely by random chance. There we go, Philip, 100 points in the chat right there. Excellent work, Philip. So let's, let's start off using um, the first thing we did in this class. The very first thing we did was a mosaic plot. The mosaic plot right here looks likely by random chance or unlikely by random chance given there's no association. Given there's no association between the two values, this mosaic plot looks likely by random chance or unlikely if there's no association. That right there looks likely by random chance or unlikely if there's no association between them. Ah, this one looks likely by random chance. The one that looks unlikely by random chance would be this right here. What you've just done is you've kind of talked about the null because you're saying if there is no association, the graphic on the left looks likely that it would happen by random chance. So this graphic right here for A is the likely by random chance and graphic B is unlikely. So think about two box plots. If the di differences between them are likely by random chance, would the box plots line up or would they be very different? If differences between box plots are likely by random chance, would they line up or would they be very different if differences between box plots were likely by random chance? The differences between them would be what? They would what with each other? Would they line up or be very far apart? They'd line up, they'd be a lot closer. So if the differences between these box plots are likely by random chance, they're gonna look more like this. And over here, here's our unlikely by random chance, our counterexample. So these are some of the tests we did early on. Now also we had correlation. So graphic A is gonna be our random chance. If the correlation between two variables is by random chance, it should be close to what? If the correlation between two variables is by random chance, the correlation should be close to what? If the correlation between two variables is likely by random chance, you'd expect that correlation to be what? Close to zero. So when we did correlation, if we saw something like this, and this could also go with the slope, this is a likely correlation of zero, where this one right here is unlikely that it has a correlation of zero. So the graphic on the right is always our unlikely one by random chance, and the graphic on the left, the graphic, yeah, the graphic on the right is unlikely, and the graphic on the left is likely by random chance. Now here's where I think the confusion starts to hit. The confusion starts to hit as soon as we check uh, conditions. And don't worry, everyone, this happens all the time. People are like, wait a minute, is a high p-value good or bad? It depends. Do you want to find something that's significant? Do you not want to find something that's significant? Low p-value is always, 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 always statistically significant. So when we look at something like checking to see if our residuals are normal, the assumption is that they're normal. So... If you're checking that your residuals follow the normal pattern, what would you expect to see if they're normal? If you check to see if your residuals follow the normal pattern, and the assumption is that they're normal, it'd be likely by random chance to see things that look what? 
by random chance, it'd be likely to see things that are. And if you do get a p-value above 0.05, it's because, well, then that was likely given they're normal. So the assumption for the normality is that they are normal. So if you see that they're normal, well, then what you saw was likely given they're normal. Does that, I think that's where people get a little bit confused on this one because it's like, wait a minute, I thought normal's good. Yeah, normal's good. That's what we want. We don't, in this one, we actually don't want to find that evidence that they're not normal. So over here, is this likely or unlikely, if the residuals are normal, is this likely or unlikely to see? If the residuals are normal, would it be likely to get that pattern or unlikely? If the residuals are normal, would it be likely or unlikely to get that pattern? Unlikely. If our data has a linear pattern, if our data has a linear pattern, oops, wrong one. If our data has a linear pattern, which of these is likely to see and which of these is unlikely? If our data has a linear pattern, which of these is likely, which of these is unlikely? If our data has a linear pattern to it, which of these is the likely pattern to see? Yep. And B would be unlikely. If there's equal spread, if there's equal spread, which of these would be likely to see? Should have just kept that. <laughs> if there's equal spread, which of these would be likely to see? be graphic A. Graphic A would be the likely one to see if there's equal spread. If there's not equal spread, then we would see something like B, which is unlikely. So it would be like, oh, we, that doesn't look like that would occur given there's equal spread. So I reject that there's equal spread. I have evidence that there's not equal spread. And to contrast this with things like um, the p-values, let's look at down here. When you get output, your output says estimate and then it has standard error, then it has T, and it has p-value. So you might get, no one cares about the intercept, sorry, intercept. Oops, we'll go over here, go to the name of the variable, it doesn't go there. Go to intercept, and then B1, and then B2, and we'll put in some values. So what we see, most importantly, is just looking at the p-value, and we look at the p-value for this one, and it's 0.24, and this one's 0.01. So what does it mean that B1 is statistically significant? That means the inclusion of B1 in the model adds new information not accounted for by B2 in the model, or by the other variables, but the other variable is B2. What does it mean that B2 is not statistically significant? It means that the inclusion of B2 in the model does not add with it new information not accounted for by B1. It does not say anything that B, B2 by itself is not significant, but B2 does not add into the model new information not accounted for by B1. So you have to know what each p-value means. I know that can be a little bit confusing, but I think we covered a lot of them right now, going all the way back to the beginning, all the way up to where we mainly look at output now to look at p-values for our tests or p-values for the output. If residuals are normal and when there is not equal spread, um, kind of, Philip, kind of, Philip. When, well, what we expect, so here, let me just show it again for the, for the tests. When it comes to the tests, we do three tests. We do a test for, here we'll say, high p-value, and this, these, remember, each p-value is related to what test we're doing, low p-value. So the test for normality, you would expect normal residuals. I'm off the screen, no, I'm off the screen, good. The test for linearity, you would expect a linear relationship. The test for equal spread, you'd expect an equal spread. And for normality of residuals, it's unlikely to get something that's skewed. That'd be a low p-value. For linearity, it's unlikely to get something that bends. And for equal spread, it's unlikely to get something that has non-equal spread. So we do one with non-equal spread right here. So that's, that's pretty good. But these graphics over here on the right are unlikely to, to, to observe given we have normality of residuals, 
we have linearity of the model and we have these right here we should see things which is equal spread we should th see things that's under 10 minutes right there does do people feel like this makes a little more sense you also have to say like well what does this p-value mean it's always statistically sniffing it's below 0.05 but is that a kind of good or bad thing They're like okay does this add information to my model does this and i might need to make a flow chart of this that might help i might i don't know i've been i got i got to finish up the test but i've seen confusion of this over semesters where people are like wait i thought low p-value was good now it's bad well it's just what does it mean but hopefully that helped did that help anyone kind of set their minds straight on what these terms mean a little bit i hope i hope here let's hop back to the main screen right here Oh, Dennis, glad that helped out. Glad that helped out. Yeah, I always try to make a flowchart. <laughs> Just forget the test. So the main thing we need to know about the assumption test is high p-values like it And that's, well, so Philip, that is for every single p-value. Um, and we'll do misclassifications right here, Grant. That'll be, that'll be a little bit, Grant. You got it. Um, every p-value that is low is unlikely by random chance. And whatever we observed was unlikely by random chance. But then you have to go back and say, you know, like, well, what does that mean? And for here, I'll go to an output. For this output right here, this low p-value right here tells us that the uh, variation that dose explains in the outcome of the beetles, the variation that dose explains in the outcome of beetles is unlikely by random chance. That means that dose is having a statistically significant impact on outcome. This low p-value right here it has nothing to do with normality, has nothing to do with linearity, has nothing to do with equal spread. It's related to does dose explain a significant impact of the outcome of a beetle? And the answer is yes. The variation that dose explains in the outcome of a beetle is unlikely by random chance. To say that dose has a statistically significant out impact, like the dose of a poison, this is fun to say, right? The dose of a poison has a statistically significant outcome on the dose of on the outcome of a beetle. And we could do a much more complicated one. Go to a multiple. We're predicting whether or not someone has diabetes. And we could say uh, whether, here we'll go to a significant one. Here we go, this one. So somebody's glucose level with the other variables are already in the model accounts for a significant portion of the variation in whether somebody has diabetes. So, or we could say adds new information. Glucose included in the model here adds new information on whether or not somebody has diabetes. And um, does this make sense right here? Whereas body fat, because the p-value for this one, it might be hard to tell, the p-value is this if you remove around it, so that's not statistically significant. So the variation attributed to body, or the variation within diabetes uh, for body fat, it's like saying, no, no, is not statistically significant. It does not add within new information. Shouldn't there be a variable of whether or not someone is Wolf or Brimley? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so Nicholas Cage and drowning victims actually has a low P value. And that one's probably actually just by random chance, like, cause you can find things by random chance. So even though it was unlikely by random chance, it probably is by random chance, unless there is an association. So you would say that the variation between Nicholas Cage and drowning victims is unlikely by random chance. Thus Nicholas Cage being in movies explains a significant portion of the variation that is unlikely by random chance and whether or not people die by drowning. And it's not practically significant. And even though we're saying it's unlikely by random chance, even if you get a low p-value that's unlikely by random chance, you can still, it can still happen. Like you can get low p-values and it is by random chance. It was just unlikely. Like imagine, anyone ever have that friend? Here's a really good example. You ever have that friend who's horrible at basketball but they take the basketball and they like chuck it across the court and make like a half court shot. So like they just take the basketball and they're like, Hur! and then they just make a shot and everyone's like, whoa, but they're horrible. They're horrible. Like they made like a one in 5,000 shot. Like they're not really that good. They just chucked it. They got lucky. And so when you think about it, they made that shot by random chance. <laughs> ben and Corbin. Cor Corbin gets 200, Ben gets 100. So, you know, that person's me. That's, it's me too, Dennis. That's actually the truth. That's, I always think about that. And so what happened there is you made that shot by random chance. And so things by random chance can happen. It was just unlikely that you would make that shot. And if we try to have you do it again, you probably won't do it. Like, I won't do it either. So um, <laughs> you guys are awesome. 
Um, so when we predict probabilities right here, this is where people get confused in this class. P-values are probabilities. They're the probabilities of our results or results from our stream having by random chance variation given that the null is true. But a probability is just between zero and one. When you think about predicting an event, we will either predict whether something occurs or whether something does not occur. And if something is predicted to occur, especially if we're predicting if someone will buy, well then we will predict it when it's over 50%. So 50% or more, we are going to predict the level of interest. This is a huge thing. 100 points in the chat, you gotta write this. In logistic, the level of interest is last. 100 points in the chat. In logistic, the level of interest is last. What alliteration is Brian pointing out when he says, in logistic, the level of interest is last. There's a there's a alliteration to this. In logistic, 100 points for anyone who points out the how I'm doing the alliteration here. In logistic, the level of interest is last. What's the alliteration on? I think that's the right term, alliteration, right? In logistic, the level of interest is last. I'll take it right there, Alex, 100 points are there. It's all the L's. Logistic level last, Philip, 100 points too. So it's all that logistic level last. So that's how you know what the level of interest is. Now, does everyone understand why this is confusing? Because Emily, 100 points right there, and Joshua and Corbin. So the confusing thing is with indicators, the reference level is first. In logistic, the level of interest is last. So indicators are first. Logistic level of interest is last. So in ref indicators with the reference level. So the reference level is I am first. And then with indicators, reference levels first. So I would say I am first, logistic levels of interest last. So have that written down. Uh, I am first, indicators, reference levels, I am first. So I kind of remember like I for indicators, am first, logistic levels last. I am first, logistic levels last. It's just memorization. The first, um, like I always knew it, but then as you teach things, you don't want to like be like, wait a minute, is it this or is it this? And it's just one of those things you have to memorize. You just have to be like, I am first, logistic levels last. And then I've done this so long that I can just be like, oh, with reference levels, they're the first one alphabetical and logistic, the level of interest is last. And so we need to know this because this will help us how we predict. Now, one thing I want to say, like I say, like you need to know it, but if you're making output, you can just look at this. It just tells you. What do you think the level of interest was here? Yes or no? Do you think the level of interest was yes or no? And just read what it says. Do you think the level of interest was yes or no? First person our points. Do you think it was yes or no? No, no one knows. It says probability of liking cake. It'd be yes, meal 100 points right there, you're right. Because it says the probability of liking it, Brad also. And so that would be level of interest is yes, because the level of interest is last. And it's a probability of liking a cake. So what are we doing? What's the whole point of logistic? It's to predict a probability. And if the probability is more than 50%, 50% or more technically, we will predict the level of interest. Now, this is where we run into a problem. If you notice these curves right here, they're not a line. Because what would a line immediately start to do? A line would escape where? it would escape this zero one boundary. Like if you had a line going through here, it would leave that boundary. So what have we done? We've taken our usual model a B zero plus B one X. And all we've done is done E raised to the over one plus E raised to the, so let me pull up a thing right here. I just want to show you how to write it. I thought this was the hardest thing to memorize how to write. I was like, oh my gosh, I can never memorize this. I'm never going to get it down. But all it is, is E raised to the regression equation over one plus E raised to the regression equation. That's it. That's the whole thing. What is the regression equation? The regression equation is equal to B zero plus B1, X1, if you're just doing the simple thing. Now, you might be like, why are we doing this? Well, watch this. Watch this trick. You ready? I got enough room on here. So let's go right here. And let's try a few values. Let's try 
the highest value we can think of for the regression equation. So what is the highest possible value you can think of for the regression equation? What is the highest value you can think of? What is the highest value you can think of? Who can think of the highest value? When you think of a really high value, theoretically high value. No one knows. 100 points, highest value you can think of. We're going to plug it into the regression equation like we solved for that value. I get scared when goes quiet. I'm like, oh no, are we not streaming anymore? 200 points to that value. Who's got the highest value you can think of? For the we're going to plug it in right there and here. Who knows? Wake up with the 300 points. Let's see who knows. Highest value you can think of. A theoretically really, really high value. Think of like only theoretical numbers though. I might have to give away the answer. We're gonna plug in that value right here. And the highest possible theoretical value I can think of would be, well, not 10. 10 is the biggest number. You, 300 points, Ben, for responding. Think of something way bigger than 10. Way bigger than 10. Way bigger than 100. Way bigger than a million. Way bigger than a trillion. Way bigger than a quadrillion. Way bigger than a quintillion. Way bigger than a sextillion, octillion. I can't think of infinity. Ryan, right? 300 and Emily, 300 points. You guys got it. So infinity. Let's plug in infinity. What does this solve out to when you raise e to infinity over 1 plus and e to infinity? A septillion. <laughs> then there's octillion and not. I can't. I don't know the ones beyond that. What does this solve out to now? Will it forever get close? Yes, Mila. Mila, you see it. That if you do this and your regression goes to infinity, then y goes to 1. How about if we do negative infinity? If this were to go to negative infinity, I think I do this. This goes to negative infinity. Negative infinity makes numbers really small. Philip, 300 points right there. Negative infinity makes numbers really, really small because they go to decimals, because they, they, they flip. And so if you raise something to negative infinity, I guess unless you raise a decimal to negative infinity, then it would go crazy large. But um, this right here, E is not a decimal. It's 2.718281, yada, yada, yada. But what would this go towards now if we have negative infinity on here? If we have negative infinity, the equation would go towards what? I think this is going to get really small. Like this will go to zero, and this will go to zero, and it'll be zero over, you got it, Emily, right there. 200 points, Emily, big points today. And so now there's one number that's directly between these. What number is directly between these? And this is the big thing, especially in the assignment. One number that is between these is zero. If you were to have e raised to 0 over 1 plus e raised to 0, what does e raised to 0 equal to? What does e raised to 0 equal to? I'll solve out this. e raised to the 0. Well, that would just be 1 over 1 plus 1. And that it solves out to 50%. So now that's 1 half. So with all of this right here, what have we shown? We've shown that these equations, no matter what we plug into the regression, whatever we solve out for, has to be bound between 0 and 1. So we literally just did this right here. Now, depending on the sign of the coefficient, it can go down or up. So if we were to have a negative coefficient, it's just going to make it sigmoidal negative. But your equation that you have right here, this equation is bound by 0 and 1. And this is a sigmoidal curve. Sigmoidal just means S-shape. So we have an S-shaped curve right here. It is a nonlinear sigmoidal curve. And sigmoidal just means S-shape. So make sure you understand that we're no longer fitting a line. We have left the line behind. Because the line would immediately escape this. The line would go outside of this. So we are not fitting a line. We are fitting a sigmoidal S-shaped curve. But even then, this curve might not be the right idea. And I disagree with this graphic I always have because I always think you should 
soft baked cakes or cookies because I like cookie dough. I like cake batter. I, I, I'll 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 risk the salmonella. In this crazy world we live in, <laughs> I'll risk the salmonella. So it's the least of my worries these days. <laughs> But we see right here that if you undercook a cake, people are not going to like it. And if you overcook the cake, what is ooh, thousand points? This curve, the sigmoidal curve is nonlinear. And it's one other word, thousand point question. It's nonlinear, but it's also this thousand point question. It's nonlinear, but it's also this. I'm showing you what it also is. The key word you should know for thousand points. It's your favorite band. Mm, it's not really skewed. 100 points are there, Ben. Because it's this is a XY relationship. But good good shot right there. I like it. It's your favorite band. Monotonic Brennan right there for the thousand points of the day. One direction. <laughs> it goes in one direction. It's monotonic. So monotonic means it goes in one direction. And so this goes in one direction. It goes constantly up. So this curve right here is not monotonic. So we can't really fit the sigmoidal curve to it because sigmoidal curves will always go up in one direction or they'll always go down in one direction. So a sigmoidal curve like these right here go up in one direction or they go down in one direction. E either way, just depends on the coefficient. And what do I mean by that? When I'm saying it depends on the coefficient, I'm talking about this. If the coefficient here is positive, it goes up. If the coefficient is negative, it goes down. It's just sigmoidal up, sigmoidal down. And so that's all we have going on right here. Not too much to understand. And yep, this is just probabilities. Don't worry, I don't think these slides really help right there, but here's the big thing. This is the most amazing thing in the world, but it's gonna, it's not gonna, you're gonna be like, wait a minute, that's not fair though. And you're like, okay, Brian, what, what's gonna happen here? In regression, we always have to mention the units. When we do a regression, just regular old regression, we have to say like two tables at a restaurant that differ by how many people are in the party by one person are expected to differ in the amount they tip by $3 where the table with the additional person is expected to tip three more dollars. Does that make sense? And if it's a multiple, two otherwise identical tables at a restaurant that differ in one person are expected to differ in the amount they tip by $3 where the table with one more person is expected to tip three more dollars. And what do I mean by otherwise identical? They came in on the same night, they bought the same amount of food, like they had the same bill, but this one had one more person. Like they're otherwise identical, but this table had one more person. And it doesn't matter um, where we're at. That difference right here is always the same. If you notice right here, there's always this same difference in Y. But when you do logistic, it's not always the same. But what is one thing that's always true about the probability, especially for this one, of the person with the higher X? For the person with the higher X, like this person versus this person, or this person versus this person, because they have an X5, they have an X6, or this person versus this person, or this per the person with the higher X, what about them? Exactly, Philip, 100 points right there. They're gonna be closer to one, which means they have the higher probability because we're trying to predict the probability that they do something, like maybe it's the probability that they purchase the Cookie Monster at Cheddar's. Has anyone ever had the Cookie Monster at Cheddar's? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Is that what it's called? Or did we just call it that? What it is, is it's, it's a, it's a soft-baked cookie in a pan. I want this now. <laughs> and so, and then they scoop ice cream on top of it and put hot fudge on it. So you've got this cookie drowning in hot fudge and an ice cream on it. And it's just like a cookie that's like yay big. Exactly. Phil knows what I'm talking about. I have a cookie monster. Whew. I would I would go in and get it sometimes just as my meal because it's a lot. It's probably it's probably like 1,500 calories. But man, I'd be like I'm just gonna go in and eat a cookie monster. Like it'd be it'd be like Friday night. <laughs> See, some people are like I'm gonna go out to the bars. And I'm like I'm gonna go to Cheddar's. It's 10 p.m. on a Friday night. I know. It's talking about all oh, the molten lava shake. Oh man. Okay, Philip. Philip, we're gonna have to try that. Philip. Philip likes the cookie monster and he's suggesting to us the molten lava cake. See, I gotta watch out for those things. They're so good that I'm just like, what was it? Oh yeah, uh, Domino's had like a molten lava thing for a while and I'd order that with like my pizza and I'd eat my pizza and then I'd be like, oh no, I gotta eat that molten lava cake. <laughs> but anyways, so what are, we, what are we doing here? We're talking about the probability of somebody buying that cookie monster because the probability of somebody buying it, oh, skillet cake, oh no, Ben, you did not go there. Everyone knows that's the best. And you can get those extra chips. Oh, cinnamon delights. Okay, I gotta try that, Alex. That sounds really good. 
Man, one of these days I'll have Taco Bell again. Oh no, wait. So what are we predicting here of somebody buying the Cookie Monster? Because this these are models that businesses can use. Why are we talking about food and whether or not somebody somebody buys it? Why am I all of a sudden talking about that in the chapter? I'm not saying how much they spend on the food. I'm saying whether or not this table will buy a Cookie Monster. W what is changing here about the way we're using this in this chapter for me to say whether or not a table buys a Cookie Monster, whether or not a table gets skillet queso, whether or not a table gets a lava cake at Chili's. Like this is a whether or not scenario now. Like what is the what is the difference with this chapter when I'm like whether or not the table gets a Cookie Monster? Well, two tables that are otherwise identical, where this table has a um, a child at the table, the probability of them getting a Cookie Monster is higher than the table that does not have a child. Would that be right? Reference levels, I am first. So no, yeah, so the, yeah, it would be that. I just didn't, I just did an interpretation of an indicator in a logistic regression. What is the whole point of this chapter for me being like, whether or not a table orders a cookie monster? So like, this is like whether or not a table orders a cookie monster and why does that relate to this chapter? I could say two tables that are otherwise identical where one table spends a dollar more, the table that spends a dollar more is more likely to buy a Cookie Monster. So what it is, is if it's positive, then no matter what the X is, like don't worry, so it does have like a, a steeper slope to it. If you notice, like it does have like an area where it has a big gradient change, but no matter what the X is, if it's positive, if they're higher in the value of X, they will be higher in the value of Y. Not that they will be, but just mathematically. Like mathematically they will be, but I'm not saying will be as an interpretation because interpretation would be like if this was a uh, number of children at the table. So we're looking at the probability of somebody ordering a cookie monster. And so here it is right here. And we're saying the number of kids they have at the table, which my gosh, this family just went all out. You know, it's like, a, think about this. When would somebody have 10 children at a table at a restaurant? When would there be like 10 children at a table at a restaurant? What? Oh man, if only I went outside. Birthday parties. <laughs> no, that's the thing right there. Birthday parties, things like that. And just think about this. You're not saying they will order it, but the probability is very high. Oh man, will that work? Oh wait, oh, I have to hit the randomness button here. Boom. Don't don't take us down, Monster Cat. We earned that randomness. I don't know. I'm so afraid to put credit cards in online these days. I know people are suggesting me privacy.com. Thank you for all the suggestions. Man, this is, they're going to steal my info. Everyone's going to steal it. <laughs> so with this right here, two tables that are otherwise identical, but differ in the amount of kids they have by one, the table with more children there is more likely to order a Cookie Monster. Does that make sense? That two tables that are otherwise identical, I'm pretending it's a multiple regression, but they differ in the number of children they have at the table by one because our X is gonna be number of children. The table with more children in it at it is more likely to order the Cookie Monster. Does that make sense? And we can see here that the probability has a sharp increase around like five or six where, if, especially if you look at restaurant data, this seems pretty accurate. I would say I sold a Cookie Monster to maybe one in 15 or 20 tables. It was like our most popular dessert at Cheddar's when I waited tables. But, it, you know, it's you'd sell maybe two or two a night or something like that to like 20 tables. So the probability is pretty low. But especially, man, if there was like a kid or something like that, they'd be like, hey, you want dessert? And the kid would be like, yeah. And they'd look through the mail, like, ah, the Cookie Monster. So it's just got a good name. It's got a name that, you know, people like. And it's really good. It's really good. I miss it. There was, there was one dessert at Cheddar's. The millionaire, if anyone remembers that besides me, I'd be like, did you work at Cheddar's? And the millionaire was, uh, it was cheesecake, brownie cheesecake with ice cream between it and pecans on it. It was so much. And it was like five or six dollars. And if you bought that dessert, you could eat it. Like you could get three servings out of it. I'm sure. I mean, you can buy a gallon of ice cream for like five bucks, but brownie cheesecake with ice cream and everything. I'd get that dessert to go with like my employee discount for like three dollars. It was bad. <laughs> I know. I know, right? It was brownie cheesecake. So you could kind of like cut it in half and like cut off the brownie cheesecake part of it. And then like get a little brownie. Oh, it's so good. So interpreting the coefficients is key right here. Now, this is something you'll need in your assignment. And this is the last assignment. But this right here, 
solves the regression equation for zero. Does everyone see this? Please take a note. Put down this in the chat for 100 points. Slide 27 lets you solve for the probability of 50%. Just that right there. And I'll show you how to solve for it in a second. But slide 27 shows you how to solve for the probability of 50%. Just boom right there. Big note to know that that's where that is. Pretty easy to find. Well, when you know where it's at and it's used in the assignment. So make sure you have that right there. What we need to know is that the probability, Ryan, 500 points, Ryan, first person to do that right there, and 200 mil, another person gets some hundreds. Make sure you know slide 27 shows how to solve for the 50% uh, break off right there. And what does this mean? Well, let's look at our uh, beetle example. Well, that shows you right there. So if I'm looking at this right here, what we do is we take right there, James, 100 points, nice job. And we need to do negative B0. Can anyone tell me what the value of B0 is? Oof, I'm scared. What is the value of B0? Someone help me out here. What is the value of B0? I'm gonna do negative B0. What is, what is the value of B0 right here? Anyone know what the value of B0 is? What is, what is, yep. Grant, nice job, 100 points Grant right there. Great job, Grant. So it's negative B0, negative B0 divided by B1. And there you go, I could have just kept them both positive. And that right there is the amount of dose that a beetle would have to have a 50% probability of living. So this number right here is the point at which a beetle would have a 50% probability of living. This exact dose, 15.2. And look at this right here. Where does it have a 50% probability? Right here is 15.2. That line we just calculated by the negative B0 over B1, which they flipped them both to positive, perfectly fine right there. Our number here of, it must round up to 15 point, yeah, that's 15.3. This right here is the 50, 50 point and you can see what happens to the probability that a beetle is alive as its dose increases. As the dose of poison increases, the probability that a beetle stays alive goes what? Is it also the max slope? Is it? Um, maybe. Don't think of it as slope too much, though, because remember, it decreases. Um, Brad, look into that. I've never... It might be the way it works for the model, like... If we were to do calculus and look into it, um, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Brad is totally right. Brad, another Brad, you're at a thousand. You're saying this is where the slope is at the maximum at this point. Yes, because since it's like going through fifty percent, that's when the slope will have the steepest point. That is a hundred percent accurate, Brad. You are completely correct. That is the steepest point of the slope, and we could like do some calculus. For the, yep. But you're totally right, Brad. That is the steepest point on the curve because it's the middle, and the curve won't like start slowing down because it's it's uh, monotonic. So at that point, it has to start changing its derivative. I think if anyone loves calculus, right here, you can see like we've got a curve right here, and this is where like the derivative change, where it goes from concave down to concave up. Hopefully, I'm getting those concave right. But um, if you do some calculus on this, this is the derivative change. So that would be where the the tangent line would be. I gotta remember my calculus. I don't know. Calculus is important, but we don't use it that much in statistics. We use things like linear algebra, which I like more. Linear algebra is better. Sorry, calculus. And so we see right here how to use the equation. The whole point of this equation is to make probability predictions. We're just going to use this for probability. We're not going to say what will happen. We're just saying two beetles that are otherwise identical, where one beetle gets a higher dosage of poison than the other beetles, that beetle is what? So think about the interpretation right here. We we'll, we can do the interpretation pretty well to say two beetles, and we don't have to say about otherwise identical, we could say two beetles that differ in their dose of poison by one dose of poison. The beetle with the higher dose of poison is more likely to be dead or not be alive, or is less likely to be alive, just depending on how we want to say it. So I guess technically, if it's a negative coefficient, is less likely to be alive. Does that make perfect sense how to interpret this? Two beetles that differ in their dose of poison by one dose, the beetle with the higher dose is less likely to be alive. And just look at this right here. That's totally it right there. And one thing I did not do, do not mention the coefficient. I'm going to, I got to write so many trick questions right here. Alex, help me out with this. Alex, I'm throwing Alex a thousand points. 
please put a note in the potential test questions to be like, don't mention the coefficient in logistic, because you'll notice I'm not saying it's probability decreases by this amount. That's a trick question I can catch so many people on. Everyone's going to see it. I'm going to put some interpretation of coefficients on the test and people will see like, oh, it's less likely by this amount. Like there's a difference of this amount in their probabilities. No, because the difference is not constant. Going back to here, the difference in regression is constant. Philip, you're at a thousand. Thank you, Philip, for all these amazing notes. Off top of it was the bonus assignment on the assignment category or the overall grade. It'll be on the assignment category. It's, it'll, we'll do an additional drop of assignments. And so you don't have to do the bonus. It'll just be an additional drop. But if you want and you get it, good job. Great job, Emily. 100 points, Emily. Thank you for asking. And so in logistic, do not, as Philip put in all caps, do not mention the coefficients in logistic because you just talk about the sign of it. The whole, what sign is the coefficient in this one? What is the sign of the coefficient in this regression? Like, remember, signs can only be one of two things, positive or negative. So the sign of the coefficient in this regression is obviously what? Positive, yep. And you're not, you're not going to mention what the coefficient is. Like just over here, we don't talk about the coefficient, we just mention the sign of it. So when I'm saying that two beetles that differ in their dose, by one dose, uh, the beetle with the higher dose is less likely to be alive, I'm saying less likely because the coefficient is negative. I could say more likely to be dead, but if we're going to talk about the level of interest, which is live, and the level, the not level of interest is dead, so it's either live or dead, but level of interest, last, so we're predicting that right there. And once again, you can plug in any value right here. Now, what does this mean that we have this right here? We have beetles that receive a dose of 20 on average would live 10% of the time. So among beetles that receive a dose of 20, like in the long run, we're not saying like one beetle has a 10% chance of living. We're saying like in the long run, beetles that receive a dose of 20. And this, this slide right here is also key. All you do, and I'm going to put this in the chat, and you can plug this into R, but you do E raised to the regression equation over 1 plus E raised to the regression equation, and E raised to it is the EXP. So it's E raised to your regression equation over 1 plus E raised to your regression equation. What value, someone put in notation, what value is this right here. I want the notation for what this value is. What value in notation is that? What is that value in notation? First person, 1,000 points. We're going to do 1,000 for each of these. On first person only. Get you guys up to the 1,000 today. B0, you're totally right, Alex. That's B0. What value is this right here? Who's going to get this one? What value is this right here? That's B0. Alex, oh, Alex you only get 1,000. Alex, you're still 1,000. Oh, great job, Alex. Someone's got to say besides Alex. This was B0. James was right. This is B1. And then what value is this right here? What value is that right there? What's this last value right here? That's B0 plus B1. Nice job, Alex. <laughs> Alex, you had 2,000. I like it. I don't want people to stop answering because they get the points. But I do want to earn, and Joshua, Joshua, you get the 1,000 also. So Alex, you broke the rules. You're at 2000. I like it because I always want you guys to keep answering. I want you to just keep, I like to reward as much as I can. If you're answering still, I want you doing it. Just it's practice to say this is B0 plus B1X. So B0 plus B1X. And that's what's going on right here. That's the notation. And it's just E raised to the regression equation over one plus E raised to the regression equation. We can see this in the notes all the way back here. E raised to the regression equation over one plus E raised to the regression equation. Nice job, Alex, on all those points. Got some me mega, mega points today. So with this right here, so over 10,000, I like it. I think, did you send me the over 9,000? Someone sent me over 9,000. <laughs> I love those. You see, some DBZ. I'm into some DBZ. Let me get caught up. Whoa, Andrew. Andrew's just like, here's some points for you right here. So we've got here log income. This is whether or not somebody donates. And what are we going to predict? Are we going to predict whether someone donates or no donate? Are we going to predict donate or no donate? What will we predict? Donate or no donate? Which of these will we predict? Donate or no donate? Which of those will we be predicting? Donate or no donate? No donate. Brad, 100 points right there. 
And the reason we'll be predicting no donate is because it's the um, last one because donate is D and no donate is N. And so with this right here, we've got our intercept, we've got the log income. And here's what's really crazy. This p-value is statistically significant, right? The p-value being statistically significant, take a look at this. The model is going to predict at all points that people, no matter their income, would want. No matter their income, people will always what? I know Henry, Henry gets those big points. Henry, great job. No matter their income, it's going to predict that people will what? I just put in a 50% line. No matter their income, somebody is going to what? No matter their income, the model will predict every single person will what? No matter their income. Ah, careful. Probability of no. And this is the model that as people's log income goes, they exactly. So this model actually predicts every single person does not donate. And this model does just as bad as the what model for 5,000 points. Oh, why'd I do that? Who's going to get it? This model does just as bad as the what model. There's a huge note. When I give big points, you should know it. Like, I mean, boom, Mila right there. Does just as bad as the naive. Right there, Corbin, Corbin. Let's give Corbin 2,000 really close right there. And Megan gets 1,000 and Ryan gets 1,000. So those you're at those points. But Corbin, you were so close that you get 2,000. So that, you break the rules today. And Mila really broke all the rules. So along with, was it, was it, I can't remember, was Alex breaking the rules too? So the naive model. This is a huge thing. This is when Brian gives big points, be like, what's going on? So the naive model in logistic, <laughs> the naive model in logistic predicts the majority level. So think about this. Most people on UT's list of donors, what do you think they do? Most people on UT's list of donors donate or don't donate. Most people on UT's list of donors in a fiscal year, do you think most people donate or most people do not donate? And you can kind of think about where the naive model would be at. It would be a flat line probably about there. That's good enough. That's about where the naive would be at. Do not. So most people do not donate. So if you had to take a guess, random person, do you think this random person will donate or not donate? If you had to guess for a random person, random individual, do you think they, you would think they would not donate? Because most people do not donate, a random individual, you would just say not donate. If you notice, I'm not saying anything about their income, which is the X variable. I'm just saying random person. So how do we figure out the majority level? All we do, and this was in 474, I was just doing this a while ago, and we talked about during class as a review. All you have to do is make a table of the variable. So if you went and you wanted to look at the majority level um, for like whether or not a beetle survived, okay, give me a second, because I'm not gonna have audio on the next screen. I'll get fixed. Okay, there we go. Cool. Let's hop into R. What is going on with my Go XLR? I bet you. Oh, the Go XLR is working. That's weird. You never know what's going on. I thought it wouldn't change my audio level, but it did. And so now we're gonna load up the poison data. We've got the model. And the way to figure out the majority levels to do the following is if you go to the data. What? I'm not spelling it right. What is going on? There's the poison. Oh my gosh. I don't know how to spell everybody. <laughs> it doesn't have two eyes. <laughs> Brad, 100 points right there. So, uh, I'll come right here. Okay. What would you predict for any beetle? Any random beetle, what would you predict? Any random beetle, what would you predict? Any any random beetle, what would you predict? So just take any random beetle and what would you predict for it? They will die. That's the majority level. And so that's what we would just predict here for any random beetle. We can go to visualize model. We should get the visual. Good stuff. There's the visual of the model. And we saw this earlier. I'm going to disappear. Boop. 
and you can just see two beetles that are otherwise identical but differ in their dose. The beetle with the higher dose, I mean, it's a simple linear go, so we don't have to say otherwise identical. But two beetles that differ in their dose by one unit of poison, um, if that's the dose, the beetle with the higher dose is less likely to be alive, and that's also shown by the negative coefficient right here. So we would also predict a random beetle with no knowledge, we would predict that that beetle would die. Now, a really important thing. Now, I think Grant asked this earlier. So Grant, you're at a thousand points. Thanks for asking, Grant. Confusion matrix is a big thing for this because um, this is a big thing I want to talk about today right here. The confusion matrix shows us we predicted that 254 beetles would die and 254 beetles actually died. Does this make sense? So we were correct in our prediction right here. We predicted it would die. I mean, it actually did die, excuse me. And then we predicted it would die. So we predicted it would die and it actually did die. Now, where else are we correct in here for a thousand points? What other number in this is correct? That's a weird way of asking a question. It's like, what do you mean correct? Like we accurately did it. We, we were right in what we said. So what other number is correct in this graphic? Let's see, well, no one's got it yet. What other number was a number where we were right in this graphic? Be very specific. Give me the number. 144 James worth a thousand points right there. We're getting people to the thousand day. Yep. The 144 is correct because we predicted these beetles would be alive and then they actually were alive. Does everyone see? And maybe I need to, you know, what might help. Always give me advice. Be like, that really helped or no, Brian, that, that did not help me at all. I do not understand. <laughs> you can say that. <laughs> So let's hop right here and let's show it. Boop. So when we look at where we're correct, if you trace down where we predict them to die and they actually die, that's correct. And if you trace down where they're predicted to live and then they actually live, that's correct. So this is where these meet. If you notice, if you go right here, this meets on actually died, predicted to die. Actually lived, gotta go underneath that one, predicted to live. Does that make sense right here that like, these are the beetles, there was 254 beetles that were predicted to die and they actually did die. There was 144 beetles that were predicted to live and they actually did live. Now these right here are where we go wrong. So this model, has a accuracy of what? Who here, for 5,000 points, one more 5,000 today, get everyone awake. Who here can tell me the accuracy of this model? I'm gonna do a crazy thing after this, get ready. Who here can tell me the accuracy of this model? And I'm trying to compute it in my head right now as we speak, so be working on it. What is the accuracy of this model? 5,000 points first person, this is crazy points today. 83, okay. I know the fraction, I just can't solve it in my head. Oh, okay, no, wait. Okay, I basically have it now. What is the accuracy of this model? Does anybody know? The accuracy is how often the model is correct out of all the data. Who knows the accuracy of this model? Who can get it? This could very well be on the test. I can just give you this graphic with nothing else and I can say, what's the accuracy of the model? And there's gonna be a 10,000 point follow-up. It's close to that, Brad. Is it? It's close to that. Mila, right there. Mila, you're right. I think that's correct. So what we need to do is we need to figure out how often this model is correct. We'll see. I think Mila got it. So we need to figure out how often this model is correct. So this model got this correct, and this model got this correct. Did everyone? Does everyone see? I now know how often the model is correct. Does this make sense to everybody that 398 is how often the model is correct? Is everyone following me on that? We're good on that here, I'll reappear. Boop. This is how often the model is correct. And then of course the numbers behind my head, which I need. So that is how often the model is correct out of 481. And that is the accuracy of the model. This model accurately predicts how often a beetle will be alive or dead 82.7% of the time. Does that make sense? Who's with us on that? that this model accurately predicts how often a beetle will be alive or dead 82.7% of the time. That's how often the model accurately makes predictions. But now we get to the really tough question worth 10,000 points. What 
is the accuracy of the naive model. And this people just can't do this one. They're like, I can't do it. I have no idea. Well, I'm going to help you out right here as we talk about this. The naive model has no X's. What make predictions or explain? X's make predictions or explain. So the naive model has no X's. The naive model has no X's. Be thinking about this while I'm talking about this. The naive model has no X's. So think about what the naive model would predict. And think about the accuracy of the naive model. So what is the accuracy of the naive model? I'm trying to solve it in my head as I look at it. Okay, I got a decent guess on the accuracy. Eh. The naive model has no X's. So the naive model would make no predictions. I mean, it, it would make predictions, but it can't make them based on the X's. That's what the naive model knows. The naive model does not have any X variables. So what would the what would be the accuracy of the naive model? That's the, that's what the naive model has. It doesn't have the X's to make predictions. It All it has is Y. It just has a table of the Y variable. So what would be accuracy for 10,000 crazy points today? What would the accuracy, and you better believe, if I can remember, I'm putting these on the test. What is the accuracy of the naive model? It might be, Henry and Ben, we might give you both the 10,000. It might, uh, someone else take a quick guess at this or else, because they might have it. Is it that? It does look to be about that. Connor might be right. We'll see who's right. Okay, it looks like it looks like it is 60.5. Yep. 60.5. We just remember what is the naive model going to predict? The naive model predicts the what level for the y variable. What would the naive model predict? And we did this earlier. The naive model for every single beetle would predict that those beetles what? The naive model is going to predict what for every beetle? It predicts the majority level. So this is going to predict for every single beetle, it's going to do what? It'll predict every single beetle does what here? Because it predicts the majority level. It predicts whatever the majority level, they will die. Because does everyone see this right here is the majority level. So since that's the majority level, every beetle will be predicted to die. So it'll get these right. It'll get these beetles right. And it'll get these beetles wrong. Does that make sense? This is for the naive model, which predicts the majority level. Did you? I think you, did you get it, Ben? Oh, you weren't, wait, 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 Ben. No, Ben and Henry, you got it. Ben and Henry, you got it. Ben, you you got it. No, because I'll accept that. I don't think you guessed 60%. So, no, you got it. It was you, Ben, and Henry, you got it. So you you were first, uh, along with Henry. You got it. You definitely earned it, Ben. Um, I'm, it's, I, I would assume you did not guess 60%. I assumed you had like you, you worked it out and you did this. So good job there. So knowing what the naive model is, is key. Knowing what the naive model is, is key. Let's hop back. Okay. Excellent work. Guess what? We've done simple linear, we've done simple logistic regression. And we can see here another model making predictions. And you might say that's not a sigmoidal curve. Well, it is. It's a sigmoidal curve. This just zoomed in. <laughs> now that we've done simple logistic regression, multiple logistic regression is just the same thing. Multiple logistic regression, which we should get through quite a bit more bit of notes today. Multiple logistic regression is just the same thing with more variables. That's all it is. And guess what? The difference here is if we're interpreting these coefficients, it'd be two otherwise identical tables at the restaurant said otherwise identical, that differ in the amount of kids they have by one, the table with more kids is expected to have a higher probability of buying a cookie monster. Once again, I don't interpret the coefficient, but does anyone notice the only difference is that bingo. And that's for logistic, in logistic. Put a quick thing, Philip, say in logistic real quick. In logistic. So two otherwise identical tables at the restaurant that differ in the amount of kids they have by one kid the table with more children at the the table with more children is a, has a higher probability of buying a cookie monster let me slow it down and say it one more time two otherwise identical tables at the restaurant that differ in the amount of kids sitting there um, by one the table with more children has a higher probability of buying a cookie monster and so one thing i also want to point out that philip in the chat 
if this was regression, let me put in the chat, what does the naive model predict for quantitative regression? And Andrew could help us out here. Andrew, a thousand points if you can tell us in the chat and you can add that onto your points today. But Andrew might be one of the people who knows like that in quantitative, what does the naive model predict? In logistic, it predicts the majority level or when we're doing categorical responses, the naive model predicts the, the majority level. But in quantitative, the naive model predicts the what if why. In, excuse me, in, in regular old regression, sorry. In regular old regression, just quantitative regression, the naive model predicts this of why instead of the majority level. Categorical is the majority level. And when it's quantitative, it's the blank of why. Grant right there, 1,000, you earned it. Um, I think if to grant you at 2,000, great job all the questions today and all the answers. Um, it predicts the mean of Y when it's quantitative. So when Y is quantitative, it's the mean of Y. When Y is categorical, it's the majority level of Y. And it's like, wait a minute, but are they both the naive? Yes, because uh, it's a different type of variable. So <laughs> Andrew like jumped over his room. He's like sprinting and like knocking over stuff. Oh no, Andrew. So we see right here interpretations of coefficients. And this is a really important slide right here. When we interpret coefficients, it matters if the X is quantitative or categorical. Now, when we say otherwise identical, I need to hear you guys saying in the chat, when do we use this whole otherwise identical phrase? When do we use, what's the point of the otherwise identical? You'll use that when it's a what type of regression. When it's a what type of regression, you will say among otherwise identical. Multiple, yep, because that's saying everything else held constant. Brad right there, great job. Right here at 2000, so just, everyone's points are going crazy today. So otherwise identical, otherwise identical is from multiple. And what we're saying right here is when B1 has a coefficient that's greater than zero, among otherwise identical individuals, we'd expect the person with the higher X to have the higher Y probability, larger probability. And when it's categorical, which gives us indicator variables, we'll always compare the reference to the indicator among two otherwise identical individuals where one has the level of B1 and the other has the reference level, the person with the uh, B1 level has a higher probability. So the higher probability will be associated with the person with the indicator level. And we'll see this here in a moment as I do some interpretations. Now we got enough time to do a few. So here we are with the diabetes model, and here it is. So what you wanna look for first when you do interpretations is you wanna look to see whether or not something is do we not have a single categorical in here? Here we are. Now we got some categorical variables because we have whether or not somebody has an international plan. Where's that one? International plan. So we're looking to see whether or not somebody churns. Now the first question I should ask is, are we predicting churn yes or churn no? Are we predict which one of those are we predicting? Are we predicting if somebody churns yes or churns no? So yes or no, which one of those are we predicting? Are we predicting yes or no? Are we predicting yes or no? Ah, careful, careful, careful. Yes, because in logistic, the level of interest is last. So in logistic, the level of interest is last. So we're predicting yes. So with this right here, logistic level of interest last. And let's see right here, the indicator is yet, no, don't worry. <laughs> The indicator is yes, and the reference level is no, because in reference levels, I am first. And so we've got the reference level of no right here. And this would be among two otherwise identical individuals where one person has an international plan, the other person does not have an international plan. The person with an international plan is more likely to churn. And I just want you to think about this. If we have two college students at UT, and let's say they're pretty much identical, otherwise identical, like they make the same amount of calls, they uh, use the same amount of time on the phone. Yep, I'll show you that in a second, Brad. Great question in class, Brad, great question. Oh, let me let me point to that. Brad, you're at 3,000 points. So glad you mentioned that because that would really trip people up. But think about this. If churning is leaving your cell phone provider, why would a person with an international plan be more likely to leave their cell phone provider? Like everything else identical, like two people who are otherwise identical, where one person has an international plan, the other person does not, the person with the international plan is more likely to churn, which is leave their cell phone provider. They're otherwise identical. They make pretty much the same amount of calls during the nights, during the weekends. They have the same charges. Everything's pretty much identical to them. They call customer service the same amount of times. 
but one person has an international plan, the other person does not. The person with the international plan is more likely to leave and churn from our cell phone company. Well, just think about it. They have an international plan. They might be an international student or who knows what. It's just like you would, if you're, it, it makes more sense that you might be like moving or changing your location and then you would leave your cell phone provider. And Brad points out something huge here, which I should have said more about today because we did a little bit of code on it, but I didn't make it clear enough. This right here, and I'm gonna, I'll spend the last few minutes cost talking about this. Let's hop over to here. I'm gonna try not to confuse this, but here's what you should know. Here's the 30 second version and I'll give you the one minute version. When you are doing logistic, you need to do the following. You need to have, you need to have y tilde x comma data equals. So this is y tilde x comma data equals. And then you need family equals binomial. Y tilde x, maybe it'll look better if I do it like this. Y tilde x comma data equals comma family binomial. And be careful, don't do something like this right here. That won't work. And also, this won't work. You need to do GLM. I can't state this enough. Y tilde X comma data equals comma family binomial. Now, here's where I'm going to hopefully not confuse everybody. Let's see. Could teach them. A <laughs> I do like attach. Petrie hates it. Watch this. This works, but I'm gonna show you why I never showed you this and why we don't use it and maybe why Petrie and I need to fix things. This works. This creates a model right here. So reason being is the default for family. The default for family is Gaussian. And so you can do y till x comma data equals comma family equals Gaussian. Um, and that makes the linear model based on, because the family for the linear model is Gaussian. So the family for the linear model is Gaussian. So you don't have to do this though because every one of these lines of codes works the exact same way. But then you'll say like, Brian, why didn't you show us this way from the start? And I'll show you. So every, yeah, that's what I want. All, and we are done, we just ended. This is the, the extra. Every one of these lines of codes works identical. But here's the problem. The family does not have the, um, it might, you might, I might do in quotes. I'm gonna try in quotes. Um, it looks like it worked. Well, I'll be, there's a fourth way to do it. Cause this should work also. There's all, why did you see code works so many ways? Brad, you have 5,000 Brad, you've earned it. I like it. Cause, um, keep asking those questions. Keep saying like, will this work? Will this work? I mean, it's, there's, there's always more ways. And I was like, yeah. And I'm trying to think if it was that way in the notes. Um, it can be in quotes. Um, family's just pretty smart on how it recognizes it apparently. And you might say, well, Brian, why don't, why are we using this way? And I'll show you. The answer is in the following. Um, the way Petri coded visualize model, which visualizes your regression, the first thing it checks, I did try to fix this at one point. I had problems fixing it. The first thing it checks when you run visualize model is if it's GLM or LM. And so you would only need to see the GLM. Because as soon as you run visualize model, it sees LM, it makes a linear model. As soon as you run visualize model and it sees a GLM, it does a logistic scale. So because of the GLM at the start of any of these, if we visualize any of these for height weight, it's gonna do the logistic model because of the GLM, that's the way it runs. And we can take a look at that real quick right here. But the first thing this identifies in the visualize model is the um, GLM and that creates the issue right there. So that's that's why when you look at how the code runs, this code identifies first, and look at that, that's crazy function, crazy awesome function. Um, it should have an if. So is this right here, wait right there, it's checking the method. If this, then it's running this right here. So I think this is where it's identifying the GLM and yeah, that's where it's checking the class of it um doesn't change anything i don't think it changes anything if you put in quotes or not i think it still runs family equals gaussian and this is if the first value in the class of the model is equal to glm then i think this is where it's making the plot and yeah so that's 
Oh, yeah. I got it. We, Pete, you're gonna have to fix this. I got to go through this. this. Is just all the plotting stuff. That's where it's doing the coefficients and all that stuff. Model cannot. So that's where it's checking the amount of. If the length of the terms is greater than three, then stop. And he stored the terms in right here as dot character attributes. And he only took minus. He took the only the third fourth columns or so. Or is that? Or is that no? It's only a two space vector. He took out the intercept and something else maybe. I'd have to see. I'd have to like look at the steps on this to see what he's removing out right here. But it's really fun to like kind of go through these, at least for me, and be like, but you said, you, but did you say that we will use family kills bonus? Yes, correct, correct, correct. Sorry, hopefully I didn't cause any confusion. Um, these all right here, every single one of these that I did right here are linear models. And so this was like, don't, we won't do this. Let me put this this way. Here's the cliff notes. Um, the cliff notes are how to do logistic how halt to do linear. So this is the Cliff Notes version right here on the screen at the moment. This is how to do logistic at the top. And that's how, does that make sense right there, Brad? Like this is the extreme Cliff Notes version. That's how to do logistic and that's how to do linear. There's other ways, but just, it, I mean, you, yeah, you can look at the other ways if you want, but I don't want anyone to get confused because you could also, that works too. So yeah, so there's the Cliff Notes version of like what you need to know. But then of course there's like, well, you could do this, you could do this, then it'll cause this complication here. If you follow this method, you will not hit any of the issues with the plotting where you get weird plots that don't work, which are behind my head right now. Um, because the first thing it does in the code as we were showing is it identifies whether it's LM or GLM and then that causes it to do a different type of plot based on what the data is. Thank you everybody so much. Sorry we had the tech issues at the start, but I'm glad we got it fixed. I have no idea what's going on with the Go XLR. It was a, it was some sort of, should have never updated the computer. Oh, it's saying it was missing some sort of update, but the computer seems to be working really well today. Well, that's got it. I will see everybody here in a little bit. So 474, see you soon. Bye, buddy. <laughs>
Hey everybody, how are we doing? It's definitely not the final class. How are we doing? Can everyone hear and see me? We had one more tech issue this morning. I should, I'm getting ready for my move to Texas and every day I'm like moving things around and the last day, not until like Thursday, I'll be taking down the studio. Can everyone hear and see me? How are we doing? Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Jordan. So hopefully people are like, not like Brian and <laughs> kid. I know it's the final Mega Monday, so I showed, did you guys see the new Mega Man right there? Aw, well, thank you, and thank you, everyone. It's been, oof, it's been like, man, the world, 2020 is just the year that just needs to be over. <laughs> 2021 will surely be better, right? 2021 will be a much more amazing year. We've got Heal Me Pulp, the activity today. We're going to start today with an activity. I just opened it up here in the background. I took off the password on it. Let's hop here to tree-based models. And let's start talking about it. We might just hop into solutions a little bit here. Let's let's start talking about this here. Install GBM, you bet. Every time you update R, it uh, changes and removes your stuff. So we need to go back to year zero <laughs> AC after Corona. No, I'll be around. Hopefully, I'll be around every once in a while. We'll see how the schedule goes with uh, me kind of traveling back and forth to Knoxville. But I hope to make some trips to Knoxville. And I really hope to have some fun. Let me just, uh, the goal is 20. <laughs> We're doing, can we just do, can we do a speed run of 2020? Like not do the completionist strats. Let's not, let's not go for a full, like a full play of 2020. Let's just go like, let's just all go to sleep. Let's let 2020 end. If we all did that, if we all just like slept for the rest of the year, no one would go outside. Maybe COVID would end, and then like COVID, like COVID twenty one comes around. So, do we need to s set the RNG kind of rounding for the take home? Uh, I might have to run it twice. Shoot, I should have put that in there. Um, I I when I run your guys' take homes to see how the results are, and the take homes also mainly like you need to submit your written report. You need to submit like your models and your output. So the take home, uh, the way I'll grade it. And let's talk about that real quickly here. Jordan, great question. Jordan, thousand points today. And Jordan, you already got a thousand. Keep asking those questions though, because I know you'll keep asking. So when I grade your take home, here's how I'm gonna grade it. Let's talk about grading the take home real quick. Take homes out. If you have any questions, sorry that they're it looked like it was due Sunday. I saw Andrew put that in the I was like, oops. Um, the take home is definitely due Wednesday. Who's been working on the take home and how's it going? How's the take home going? One to 10 difficulty. How's the take home going? Does this take home feel easier? One to 10 difficulty. How's the take home feel? One to 10 difficulty. <laughs> you have, Kelsey has, anyone else? Anyone working on the take home? Seven. How? So five out of 10. Here, I'll ask a different question. I don't ask two questions in a row. Seven. Seven's good. Seven's challenging. A little less than halfway through, five out of 10. So we're getting five, six, is sevens, 5.23. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> So we're getting, that seems very fair. Like five is like extremely fair. And I think seven is the range of like fair, but challenging. Eight is a little too challenging. Nine is way too challenging and 10. And that's why I was, yeah. And Kelsey, that's what I was kind of getting at is I think this one's easier. Um, it's not as hard on the coding. Once you know how to do the models, everything's basically the same. And then just making sure like there's a lot less like, why doesn't this work? And please email me if something just like doesn't work. A few people have had some random issues. Please email me. Um, I know it says you can't get help, but I'm not really helping people. I'm just clarifying or explaining an issue to them if an issue occurs. Um, I do expect you to do like 99% of the work, but if something just isn't working, please just say like, hey, Brian, what's going on here? I swear I'm doing everything right. And I might be like, well, check your code from earlier, which is, I mean, how much am I telling you if I'm like, oh, go look at the, the earlier code. I mean, just saying. Sometimes code down here has a problem because of code up there. So um, then you got to be like, oh, wait a minute. Maybe it's not the code I currently wrote, which is about the smallest of hints I can get. Like, check your other code. Um, so, but yeah, so please, please email me. So here's how the grades will work on it. And it's basically a one to 10 scale. I know, I think I might have an input now as 30 points, but just think of it as one to 10 or zero to 10. So 10 is amazing work and understanding. So I expect there to be some tens. I'm not going to give everyone tens, but uh, 10 means you know what you're doing. You can explain what you're doing. And so a 10 out of 10 means like you got it. Now, please do not send anybody work. I will be checking these for plagiarism. Do not, do not send your code. Do not send your answers. Don't do that. Um, 
<laughs> I think we'll have a lot of winners. I'm I'm very happy with like the more tens we have, the better. Nine means uh, great understanding, understanding with some errors. So what you're looking at right here is like somewhere. I don't want to put a number on it, like two through three errors, but you know, like where there's there's like minor errors on it. Like there's things where I'm just like, well, this, and I might I might do like a nine point five, so I might get a nine point five, or I'm like, well there's was these two errors so there's a little bit of subjectivity here with like you you still have a great understanding like i'm like wow you really understand the data mining topics um but there's these little gaps now eight is where we get into noticeable gaps this is where um like where if you were having a conversation with me about this and you were to say things i'm like well that's that's a little bit further away from how i would describe it but this is where the gaps are noticeable and then seven is where we get into um, large gaps in knowledge, knowledge or coding. So this is where, you know, this is the CD range. And we're saying like, the things you're saying are like, well, that's uh, very far from the truth. Or that's not how we would do that model. That's, you know, this is where we see the larger gaps. And then the big one is like a five is going to be um, portions of work missing. And then we'll just go down here to something submitted, but not much. Zero next to nothing or nothing submitted. So with right here, let's look at these final categories. And please tell me if you want clarification on any of these, but I think this should be pretty clear how I'm grading these, is I'm going to read through your report. Um, if it's clear that you have a uh, extreme understanding of the topics, you're going to get a 10. You could get a 9.5. You might see a few comments. Like a 9.5 is going to look like there's going to be a few comments where I'll be like, uh, actually, we would do this, or you should compare this, or this would mean this. You're just going to see like one or two comments. If you get a 9.5, which I think a bunch of people are going to get 9.5s, you're probably just going to see a few comments from me being like, well, we probably would say this, or well, we would do this. Feel free to refute it. Be like, hey, the notes say this, Brian. I got this straight from the notes. I'll be like, oh, well, oops. Um, because that's what we do in statistics is we argue over how to say things. So please read over my comments. You're always free to dispute anything I say. Um, submit both is, can you submit both? Submit as long as you can submit both. I might check on that, but um, it's just kind of for your own safety. You do need to submit the knitted file though. You do need to submit the knitted file. It helps me to have the RMD, but please submit the knitted file. You have to submit the knitted file because that's what I'll be grading. I'll be grading the knitted file this time. I won't be running the code. Um, so in truth, it actually doesn't matter. Um, I mean, I can go in and check your answers by going through and recreating them, but when you knit it, it'll make the answers. So you don't have to worry about the set seed because I won't be checking answers via generation. I'll be reading through the code. Um, I, and I, we will if we need it. We will if we need it. I don't think we will need it, but I will curve if something crazy happens. So don't all band together. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk, yeah, we'll talk about that today, Ahmed. I said, yeah, no, a few people emailed me about that. And please email me with questions, Ahmed. Great question. Ahmed, 100 points right there. Nishan, why not? Ahmed, Nishan, um, and Toss, and Kelsey, 1,000 points. 1,000 points max today. Um, there will be a Kahoot on Wednesday. Wednesday in the afternoon, we will do a Kahoot. And so we will talk about the variable importance. And uh, it's, it's nothing too crazy. We'll look at variable importance today. And then we'll talk about our final few models. And tomorrow, we'll get into support vector machine which is on the take home and I'm going to make the questions extremely easy on for the test. So we won't do neural nets at all. I don't, I'm not gonna put any neural nets on the test. No neural nets on the test, but support vector machine will be on there, but I'm not gonna make the support vector machine questions too hard. They won't be the hard, you'll be very happy that they'll be on there. If you go to class, you shouldn't have to do much studying outside of it. Support vector machine is not too complicated, but I'm not going to go hard on the questions. I'm not going to ask for like a complicated, like solve these crazy things out. It'll just be like, what's the purpose of it? Like you should just know what support vector machine is. So who feels good about this grading scale? What do you guys think you're going to get on the grading scale? What does, what do people think they're going to make on the grading scale? Who's got, I'm going to make a this on the grading scale, Brian. We've got a 10 right here from Andrew. Yes. Got a nine, eight, nine. <laughs> I like it right there. So let's we'll, we'll do it. Hopefully we get some nine four fives and tens. Feeling good about a nine. Good shooting for a ten. Thinking nine. Like it. So um, notice right here, you can do fine as long as you don't have the large gaps or you don't do the work 
like this right here falls into people who are just like um it is on the take home you don't have to do the neural net if you're here right here you don't have to do the neural net i forgot to take that off of it you don't have to do the support factor machine you do have to do you don't have to do the neural net you can just highlight that and skip it so if you're here listening right now i'm not gonna should i send that as an announcement you don't have to do the neural net i won't make you do the neural net i will i will count like bonus towards that andrew though i will i'll definitely it can correct you can't get over a 10 but if you do the neural net and you make mistakes they won't count off and if you do the neural net and you do it correctly you do get points like you'll like let's say you have a few little mistakes here let's put that in our notes just ready neural net neural net can only help your grade so does this make sense that the neural net can only help your grade right there so if you do the neural net you do it properly it can only increase your grade so the neural net portion of this only helps your grade does not hurt your grade and the biggest thing is just setting up the grid running the neural net not too bad but since we're not covering it i'm not going to make it worth the points and i was kind of debating this so because i was like do we get to it do i just speed run through it we kind of there's only like 26 slides on it it's not that crazy just do like layers and neurons and you're done i don't know and perceptrons so <laughs> So how are we feeling on this? Feeling pretty good? Let's get some thumbs up in the chats. Let's get some positivity. We're about to hop into the activity here. How are we doing? Let's get some positivity. I love the positivity when people are like, yes, doing well, having a good day. Look at all these packages. Do we, yes. Reg class, R part, random forest, GBM, always built on a different model, carrot, PROC, all these great things, all these amazing things right here. So one of the big things, let's stop down to variable importance, variable imp, there we go. Let's talk about what variable importance is right here. And very, <laughs> I love your guys' emojis. You guys are so awesome. Okay, so let's take a look at a variable importance right here. One of the things I like to do as I've started to code more and more is one, I don't know, there's, has anyone ever seen those videos that are like oddly satisfying, like people like power washing, like, like they're like power washing a floor or a carpet or maybe it's just like things that are like, just bring you happiness for some reason. And one of the things that brings me happiness is cleaning up code, making code look better. Like when I can read it easier, there's just something nice about that code. You see, eh, don't do that code. This code has so much to it and it's so much to read until we get it nice and clean right here. So yeah, right? It's just like, <clears throat> why, why does the code have to look all crazy? We're never gonna get it to look right. But when you finally have that moment, oh, you know what it is? I think it's this, it's too, oh, now it's now it's right. The world is right again. Oh, PROC, that's gonna, oh, look, we can fix it. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Now the code just looks like that right there. Control I, wait, are you serious? Well, that's the indent, right? Um, is control I re-indent code? Yeah, it is right there, it's re-indent lines. Will that work? Okay, wait, are you serious? The control I also does this. Here, it's backwards time. And if I highlight all this, oh, it doesn't, um, that won't work right there. Can I control Y those back? Um, <clears throat> it'll re-indent the lines. Oh, you might've been talking for that one error. Sorry, I'm redoing this again. This is so much fun to do. Can I do it on this? Nope. I don't know, maybe my control I works differently. There we go, there we go, there we go. Okay and cool 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 awesome okay these codes right this is literally your take home Who, who's been using things like this for their take home like code we have already posted let's get some yeses in the chat because this everything set up right here is perfectly fine we're going to look at um, a boosted model right here because it's got interaction depth i'm going to talk about this a little bit and we're going to talk about what this code does so let me get the notes pulled up right here and also kind of go through this a little bit right here. So two seconds, go over to the screen and let's talk about this just briefly right here. We are doing activity right now. So remember the activity is posted. I'm gonna give away all the answers. Yeah, it looks super identical. It's, yeah. Let me talk about the boosted tree for example, for a moment here. That Mega Man's rocking out. I forgot to put the elf on it though, so you can't you can't see the window close around me. But we do have him with the guitar just rocking out right there. 
So with a boosted tree, what model is Brian about to do? So we're learning what a boosted tree is, and we're also going to use it here in a second and go through some of the results of it. So a boosted tree is literally a tree that learns from other trees. Boosted trees are trees that learn from other trees. So we have some things we have to control for. We control for how fast they learn or how slow they learn. And this is called the shrinkage parameter. I don't know why it's called shrinkage. There's things I don't know. Why is it called shrinkage? I guess it's gap in knowledge is shrinking. I don't know what's going on right here. But the small learning rate is going to be a slow learner. So this requires more trees. Imagine, so if you were to think about this, you're either going to learn material slowly or you're going to learn it very quickly. And if you learn it very slowly, you buy a lot of books and learn over a long period of time. Does that make perfect sense? Like a slow learner is going to require more trees. They're going to say, I'm going to learn this very slowly. I'm going to learn to cook slowly. And I'm going to buy hundreds of cooking books and read them all and practice for years. I'm going to learn to cook slowly. And then the fast learner says, I'm going to learn how to cook overnight. And I kind of think about it. It's really funny. When I was doing karate when I was a kid, I decided to be a fast learner. And I was like, I'm going to train to be a black belt overnight. It didn't work. It was the wrong you know, way. How about someone who says, I'm going to train to be a black belt over the course of 100 years. They're going to spend their whole life becoming a black belt. Is that the right choice? Or is this the right choice? Should, should someone choose too long? Wait, you can, you can have a, a too slow of a learning or too quick of a learning? It almost sounds like we're going to what this parameter in the model. It almost sounds like we're going to what this parameter in the model. Life is short. I, it is short. Gosh, you tell me. Um, and I feel that right there as I get older. <laughs> optimize. How do we optimize it? How do we optimize it? This is a huge thing that we're going to tune it. 100 points right there, everyone. Get up to 1,000 points. I'm going back to 100 points for a little bit here. But all those answers, excuse me, guys. All those answers, um, we are going to tune it. The conceptual exam will be due t uh, Thursday at 2 p.m. The conceptual exam will be Tuesday, Thursday at 2 p.m. Thursday at 2 p.m. for the conceptual, which I'll release on Wednesday, Tuesday night, or like midnight. So, um, But this has been something key that every one of these models has things we are tuning. Like, I can't state this enough, that the whole point of this has been to try out all these different models and to see which model works the best. So we will tune on how fast the boosted models learn. So the shrinkage parameter right here, which is lambda, is just the learning rate. And we can see the mathematics. Now, do not worry. I will not have you solve this mathematics for how it learns. But we can literally see how it's learning from each tree. And we have more mathematics here. But this is the way in which it makes the predictions and the way in which it learns and kind of like the decay, I guess, shrinkage, yeah, I think I knew that, is the shrinkage is like the decay from each tree. And if we have a faster or shorter decay, it'll change the learning pattern for the model. Do not worry. You do not have to solve this mathematics. It's just that this lambda right here controls how fast it learns. We will optimize that by tuning on it. We do not know the right value of lambda. We simply tune it and figure out what the right value is. So here's the slow learning rate. There's the slow ones, and we can do a very quick one. Each tree may be really simple, and that's where we get to our second tuning parameter, the interaction depth. So the interaction depth, which we will see right here. Whoops, where is it? Really? Whoa, that's weird. Never seen it load like that. Did we seriously remove those slides that showed? No, this is the Petri slides. There's no way those slides are out of here. Because I might have to draw it then. Well, I'll be. How do those slides go away? Here, let's talk about what an interaction depth is. Okay, so what is an interaction depth? Because that's key, because that's a tuning parameter. So... In interaction depth is the following. In interaction depth looks like this. This is an interaction depth of how much? This is an interaction depth of how much? One. This is an interaction depth of two.
So it's allowing it to split that amount of times. So the interaction depth is the amount of times we allow it to split. It's how big we will grow each tree. So the interaction depth serves the purpose of how big we will grow each tree. Um, each tree is kept very simple. The number of splits for each tree is either one or two, and that's just the number of splits. And rarely more than this, this is referred to the interaction depth. So once again, please note that the interaction depth is the amount of times we split. If it's split on the other side, would it be three? Yep, 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 yep. Great job, Jordan, right there. If we were to split here, which, and the thing is, is we don't have to split there. We could also, this tree has an interaction depth of three, as does this one right here. The interaction depth just controls how many times we allow it to split, one split, two split, three splits. We don't control where it splits, it just controls how big the tree grows. So each tree will be allowed in an in interaction depth of this, like how, how many splits is the tree allowed to make? And that's the interaction depth. Does that make sense there, Adam? Really good question, Adam, 100 points. So it could split on the right, we just don't control that. We just control the interaction depth. And so that right there has that interaction depth and we just control how many splits we get with the interaction depth. And let me make sure right here. Sorry, just hopped back a little bit. And wait, we were over here. Cause we're gonna talk a little bit about these boosting trees. I can't believe that that, I hate it when we edit the slides and we take out like a slide, I think really shows a good example. I think we did this last semester because I'm like, where's my slide? There's the notes. Okay, cool. So when we're doing these boosted models here, right here, because these are gradient boosted models, that's what it stands for. You're about to see these is that we have the number of trees we are going to use. So N trees, not N tree. It's, it's so confusing because a lot of them have things that are very similar. But N trees is the number of trees. Shrinkage controls how fast we are learning. Smaller number of trees are better but smaller numbers requires a greater number of trees and this takes time. So we're just gonna try different shrinkage parameters right here. And I think we can still see the R in the background. So you can see the shrinkage right here, the ones we are trying, you can see the number of trees we're trying. Here's our number of trees, here's our shrinkage. Interaction depth, once again, controls how many rules we can put out, which controls the number of splits. We can try how many rules we want, or it's just gonna control how big the trees split that we make. Min, number of min nodes in bio, in number of min observations in nodes. That's what it stands for. Number of min observations in nodes is the minimum number we can have in a node. And what is a node? A node is one of these. This is a node down here. So when you think a number of min observations in a node, what would be a very kind of, I don't know if I would, I, let's see if we did it in our thing. What would be a really bad number to have down there is the number of min observations that is allowed to have, which that'll control the minimum number of observations we can put inside of that to make a split. What would be a really kind of like, ah, I don't know if I would go that low. Because you can't go you can't go too low. There's the number one. I, I'd be a little wary about putting one because then it's going to split off one person over here. So, and it depends on the size of the data and things like that. So um, I don't know if I would ever go down as low as one. And you see there, we're just using 10. Quick 5,000 point question. How many models are we considering? Boom, who knows it? How many models are we considering? I've got the answer. How many models are we considering with this? This is something you should have practiced up right now and you should be pretty, I love just, these are such easy test questions for me to write. That's why I like these types of questions. 5,000 points, who knows really quick. That's gonna be breaking the rules. How many models are we considering? How many models are we considering? I think I know the answer. No one said it yet. How many models are we considering? No one's got it yet. No one's got it, as far as I can tell. This goes back to our pizza making example and our cake making example. Eight, ginning, boom. Ginning's right, eight. So it's all the combinations of the tuning parameters. It's literally, to draw it out visually, what you have right now, let me look at the pattern, two, 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 one. Okay, so the way this works, and maybe this visual will help um, cement the idea down, is you've got a, a knob here. I literally clicked the black pen. You've got a knob here and it has uh, location one and has location two, I guess, wait, we should put one, 
and two, and you could set it there. You have this knob here, and this knob has location one, location two. And you have this knob here, it has location one, location two, and then you have this knob right here, and it just has location one. So when you look at this, how many ways can you set these dials? How many ways can you turn these dials? Well, this one right here, and great question, Madeline, how is it eight? This one right here has two ways, two ways, two ways, and one way. So what's the answer? It's this. There's eight ways. There's eight ways you could like manipulate those dials and make combinations of those dials. There's eight ways. No, don't worry. Great job, Madeline. 100 points, Madeline. So there's eight combinations, and you can see the eight combinations here. Do you see how it kind of goes like 500, 100, 500, 100, 500, 100, 500, 100, 4, 4, 5, 5, 4, 4, 5, 5, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. It permeates through it. Like, does this one on, off, on, off, on, off? Then this one goes in a two pattern of on, off, on, off, on, off. And then this one goes right here for all the ones that have shrinkage equal to this and all the ones that have shrinkage equal to this. So it does every combination of each knob. It like puts them in all the combinations. So it does every combination. If I do this right here, how many models will I get now? 5,000 points again, who knows this one? This one should be very quick now. How many models will I have now with this? Who knows? This is me breaking the rules. Two people will get this. Like, boom, Caroline, you got it. Yep, 16. So that's that's it right there. Oh, wait, did I not resave it? Oh, wait, 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 sorry, typo, typo, typo. There we go. There we go, there we go. Does does that make sense? Because now, if you go back to the drawing, what do I have? Uh, in the drawing, I put in, how do you find that out? Just looking at the code? Here, I'll show you real quick. Um, now, what I've done is I've changed, really, I've changed this to have two spots, and this is now this. And this is the mathematics way here, Madeline. Does that make sense on the mathematics on this? <clears throat> is this is the number, like there's there's four knobs and they each have two combinations. And so <clears throat> the mathematics is simply, <clears throat> sorry guys, I gotta mute myself when I do that. The mathematics is simply two, 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 and two now. And then here, what if I did this? So try this one, one more. Uh, well, let's do this. One more question. Uh, how many models are there now? How many models are there now in this? I think it's something different. I think it's something different. 100 points in right there, taking a good guess. Wait, is it? No, I think it's something different. Adam is right. Adam is right. And we can confirm this by going four times two times two times two. There we go. Is it who feels like this is making a little more sense right now that this is all the combinations of the ways you can permutate those variables? You understand that good. That's what we try to do. We we want to know what these things do. We want to know like what is this doing? What's the point of this? And it's basically trying out all these different combinations. That's why we call it a tuning grid, is we call it a tuning grid because it's like tuning it. It's like, it's, yeah, this is what I want people to see. It's like, okay, you're being like, let me try these different combinations of these variables to see what they do in the model. And okay, let me try this. Let me try this. Let me see if this works. Let me look at these different ways and different things and see what they do. So we get into, how did you get four? Um, it's the number of things there are right here. It's the length of this. So this has four observations. This has two observations. This has uh, two observations, and this has two observations. 100 points, thank you for asking, Sarah. Does that make sense, Sarah? Um, yeah, that's why I just try to, it, these things take a while. Like, I understand, like, the first time I saw them, I was like, what the heck's going on here? And then hopefully, as we talk through it, it makes more sense. But um, that's the number of values we have to tune in that parameter. And so a parameter is just, like, when we bake a cake, what is a parameter for baking a cake? Um, sure. Shrinkage is just how fast it learns. And the lower shrinkage rate is going to be a slower learning, which will oftentimes require more trees. And the, the higher the shrinkage, the faster it learns. And what's the optimum level of shrinkage? I don't know. 
<laughs> it just controls how fast the model learns when it's building a tree. I mean, when it's doing the series of trees. So it could it could learn through it really quickly. So if we were to put, uh, like we could throw in another level of shrinkage right here. And now that's gonna be even faster learning. So this is a really fast, this will be our fastest learning model. It'll require less trees. And then we go down to our super slow learning model. We could even put an even slower learning model. So um, this is the value, if you're looking mathematically at it, it's the value of lambda, which I believe is just gonna control the amount we bring from each tree over. So when we bring over a prediction, if you look at it mathematically, if you think about the fast learning with shrinkage, like to talk a little bit in depth of how the mathematics works, if lambda has a very high value, it's going to carry over a very large amount of the prediction from each tree to the next tree. But if lambda has a very small value, it's going to, I guess it's, that's, I know I keep saying like, I don't know why shrinkage, but it's the, how much we're going to shrink what was brought over from each tree. So it's like a percent of that prediction is then used in the next one. Um, should we leave the tuning grids? I believe so. If we, feel free to immediately Ahmed with the specific one, but if you're given certain tuning grids, leave them as is. Yeah, do not start messing around with the things like I'm messing around with unless you're told to. Um, Ishan, good question. So what do we mean when we say we're tuning it? It's like, think about like tuning a cake. When you tune a cake, what, what are the ways you tune a cake? Like we're gonna bake some cakes. What are the ways we can tune the cake? Like we can be like, hmm, let me try to, trying to change some variables in the cake. Like when you tune a cake, how can you tune a cake? Because you're just doing the same thing to your model. You're just trying to find the best model or you're just trying to bake the best cake. You could change the heat in the oven. You could change the flavors of the cake. And so we're literally, when you think about it with the tuning a cake example, you could literally make your cake grid. And so you would go in here and just say cake grid. And you would just go here and say like uh, temp and you'd put the temp, sure, why not? And then you would say uh, layers of the cake. Uh, what else can we do? Shrinkage percent icing. So, um, and then uh, let's say here um, <laughs> slices. So right now we made this a cake grid. <laughs> I know, right? We burned up these cakes. <laughs> so we're probably gonna have a lot of cakes that did not uh, turn out so well. And so now these are just the different combinations we could make for our cake. We could molten lava cake. <laughs> so these are, you know, we can we can slice it different ways. We can do different percents of icing. We can do different layers. And you can change these to whatever you want. But what's the point of this? To find the optimum cake. Because you're like, hmm, maybe we could change this. And that's why we call it like a tuning parameter. Like you're going to try to find the optimum value of it. You're tuning it. You're trying to investigate. And we don't know what the right... We don't know what the right model is. We're gonna tune through these parameters and be like, hmm, maybe we adjust this dial and the, the, the algorithm will adjust the dials for us. It'll run all these things right here. How will we pick our model? We'll pick our model based on the what portion of the data. I say this every class, I think. So 5,000 points, because I'll, I'll be really sad. We pick our model based on the what portion of the data. It, uh, We'll pick our model based on the what portion of the data. Validation, Sarah, 5,000, yes, please. Oh, that was, they, we got it, I was worried, I was worried. I was so worried, the validation. We pick our model based on the validation. Another 5,000, why not? We're just going crazy today. How do we know our model works? How do we know our model works? How do we confirm our model works? First person, how do we confirm our model works? Ishan right there, 5,000, hold out. Um, what makes our model? What makes our model? What data makes our model? What data, and we'll see the overfitting on the holdout if it's a training Ahmed right there. Yep, Ahmed, you got that one, you got the 5,000 on that one. Those are, the, those are the purposes of all those subsets of data. So you have to know what does the training do? Makes the model. What does the validation do? Let's us select the model that is going to supposedly work on the holdout. What does the holdout do? It lets us um, see if it actually works on new data, which is how we test out our model. And so you have to know all of those, which gets us to this code, this code right here. Y tilde X comma data equals comma method equals GBM standing for gradient boosted models. TR control equals fit control. That's, yeah, we need a fit control. Where's our fit control? What are we predicting? We are predicting whether or not someone will churn. Churn is a categorical variable. And I think we're fitting on uh, AUC. So where's fit control? Let's do it. 
We can find a fit control that works. Fit control. And, oh, hang on. where's our fit control? We must have a fit control here somewhere. Here we go. Yep, yep, that's good. Uh, this fit control right here, just so you can see, uh, let's just look at it briefly. We're using k-fold cross-validation. We're using five folds. Class props equals true because it's categorical. And then summary equals two class summary. That's going to tune on AUC. And verbose iter equals false limits output. So once again, to repeat, this stands for the k-fold cross-validation process. Number of folds is five. So we're doing k-fold five cross-validation. Class props equals true because it's categorical. This right here changes it from accuracy to AUC. And verbose iter equals false uh, lowers output. That's all it does is just doesn't put as much output. I mean, you can change that if you want. And going down, so much, so much right here. Where did we, let's look up the cake. There we go. And so there's the uh, GBM. Here's our train control fit control. Here's our tuning grid, which is the values we're tuning through for both because it was false, so less output. And once again, classic 5,000 points. We're turning these X's into what's what's I need to hear it again for 5,000. I'm just going crazy with the points today. You can only get up to 5,000 one time. Z scores, Andrew, right there. You got it. Those are Z scores. We know that this is going to standardize the X's. We know that instantaneously it centers and scales them. Good to go. I should have been running this in the background the whole time. Error train not found. Got to make that train data. Where do we have our train data being made? Let's go here to train. There we go. Train not found. No. Let me run everything above it. There we go. I saw some red. Might have been just warnings. Oh, no. Probably got a lot above it. Some of these models can take a moment to run. Some of these models can take a moment to run. I'll let these run right here. Let everything run in the background rather than just scrolling through. What are we running right now? We're running a forest. We're on forest here a little bit later. But we're talking about the GBM for the moment. And I will do stuff really nice for this activity. So stay tuned for some nice stuff on the activity. A random forest is very similar. It's just a whole bunch of trees working together to make predictions. And we'll just grow a random forest and see how it looks. Wait, wait. Is that the one I... Wait. I thought I ran everything. Is that... <gasps> wait, is it running? <clears throat> okay. Where did I go out to the code? Oh, here we go. So I might just ran everything above. Good. Okay. So we will have output here in a moment. Trees are trees. We are growing so many trees. You know, like those, like Mr. Beast and everyone's trying to plant like five million trees. We could we could plant five million trees. So we're we are we are doing better. Than, sorry, Mr. Beast. I mean, his videos only get like what like twenty million views. He has people count to I don't know. His videos are oddly amusing. I watched a video of his recently where he had someone counting and they got as much money as they counted up to. And I think they counted up to like $10,000. If they made a mistake, they had to start over. And I was like, oh, that's just like, and he would come in, they would come in, they'd start taking and saying random numbers. Random forest takes a while. Yeah, random forest do. Cause you're going, growing a lot of trees. This is the thing about this, like to speak more specifically about like this actual stuff right here. These algorithms are very powerful. <laughs> oh, I'd love it if we did that, Ahmed. That means, oh, I don't, you know what? I don't want us to beat that number because if we ever were bigger than Mr. Beast, we would be like insanity. I don't know. With online education, so let me give one big shout out right here is if you, if you do anything with Twitch, uh, hop over to Twitch after this semester where we're going to be doing a lot more Twitch next semester. I'm going to, I'm going to try to get a hold of, uh, one of my goals is to get, talk to Arian Foster and do like, um, cause I think he's on Twitch these days. He's like doing music and everything and he's on Twitch. And so check out Arians Foster's channel and I'm going to see if I can maybe write him or talk, like say something to him on Twitch and be like, Hey, if you want to do an interview to start the semester and students could watch it, we're actually just waiting for a model to finish right here. Oh, I should not have increased. Oof. You know what I might do? I might, this is, this was a bad idea. This was a bad idea to make this larger, but, um, do you guys think it would be pretty cool if we start off next semester with like an interview with Arian Foster and, we would just like, we can get, we'll try to spread the word through stat nation, but we'll start like, and we'll have him just talk about like maybe football memories of UT and stuff like that. And just kind of give a real positive start to the semester. I think it'd be really cool. He's, he's got a lot of good insight. He's a really smart guy who like reads up on a lot of stuff. Like I'm always impressed kind of hearing about him just like, or yeah, he was Texas running back who also played for UT 
Um, oh man, if we ever get Mr. T, I'm sorry, Aaron Foster, but the dream is Mr. T because he did the T distribution by traveling through time to make that. So I'll, Mr. T's great, but Aaron, yeah, yeah, Aaron Foster, sorry. <laughs> he sees this now and he's like, okay, you want Mr. T over me? So I see. No, I, I mean, I mean, who doesn't love Mr. T? I mean, I grew up, I grew up in the nineties. So Mr. T is, if he's not your hero, you didn't grow up in the nineties. We, the reason I stopped this right now is because of the tuning grid I made. I'm bringing this back to the values because I made a really ridiculous tuning grid and uh, I don't know how long that was going to take. Okay, good, 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 good. I'll pay the fool. <laughs> I'll pay the fool. He's, man, he's just like, ah, he had a cartoon. He's in so many good movies and he's in Rocky. So like, Man, I know, right? Is he in Hangover? I have not watched Hangover lately. Is he? Man, I'm really out of out of things if I don't remember that. Is he in Hangover? That's interesting. And Hangover came out in like what was that like 2004, 2005? Oh my god, okay, that's like old movie now. It's like old school movie. So we're just gonna wait for our GBM to run. So here, let's let's get let's hop back to the notes and talk a little bit about notes. <laughs> we're having our fun on the Mondays today, so we're gonna hop back to the notes right here, real quick. Okay, so we're gonna come back to the GBM right here, but once again, we have to know what we're tuning on. If I were in this class right now, I'd be taking notes on the different tuning parameters. I would put down my list of models, and I'd have the different things they tune on. But here's the thing: what we're doing with these tuning parameters is pretty simple. Because every model just has a different set of rules for it. Where the four rules for GBM are how many trees do you want? How quickly do you want the model to learn? How big do you want your trees to grow? And what's the minimum amount of observations you want in each node? So that's a node right there. And that's the bottom. If we go back, back, back to another model, which we'll talk a little bit more. There's the variable importance. We will be seeing this in a moment here. So that was kind of where we all started. So now we have two tuning parameters for our random forest. So the only questions you get to ask the random forest are, and you see there's the end tree. It's, it's like end trees, end dot trees, end tree. Ugh, why can't they standardize these things? They need to fix that. Um, so the two questions you ask are, how many trees do you want in your random forest? Just, you're gonna grow a forest? How many trees do you want? And the M try is gonna dictate how many predictors we have. So the M try is going to control how many predictors are in each tree. And now this is something so key. And if you are to know, like literally random forests right here are just the trees we were talking about. Does everyone remember last class where we were talking about building a tree and we were saying how each tree will make splits and it'll try to split to either optimize the sums of squared error or it'll try to optimize to lower the what? It'll try to reduce the sums of squared error or it'll try to reduce to, to lower this. We did calculations on this last time. Don't think about Gini, I mean, it is Gini, but it's a measure of what? Either we're trying to reduce the sums of squared error in the splits, or we're trying to reduce the what for a categorical variable. Kind of those, kind of those, impurity, impurity. So impurity uh, for categorical, because with categorical, and it's kind of variance too, it's like variation. It, it, truthfully, a lot of these answers are pretty much right because entropy is information lossage or leakage, they call it sometimes. RMSE is for quantitative variables, which relates to sums of squared error. And um, variance is variation. And if you have more variation, you have a higher RMSE. If you have more variation, you have more impurity. So, I mean, does that make sense? Like, you're right by saying variance, but we would say like in a categorical tree, we're trying to reduce impurity within the leaves, which would be reducing the variance. In a quantitative tree, we're trying to reduce the variation for the quantitative variable, which would mean there's less sums of squared error because there's less variation. And if there's less variation, it's gonna be like this and there's less sums of squared error. So just understanding how these terms work and how each of these trees is optimized, because now instead of doing one tree, we're gonna have a whole bunch of trees come together with a random forest and they all get to vote. But here's the thing, when we do this, every tree is going to be built. So we're doing bagging a random forest, we're gonna talk through this day, we're gonna talk through activity, we're gonna to review tomorrow and do a little support factor machine tomorrow. 
So when we do this right here with the bagging in the random forest, what's going on? Instead of one person making a guess, we're gonna have a whole bunch of people make guesses. So we're gonna to average together these guesses. So how does this relate to what we're doing? Instead of one tree making a guess, we're gonna have all of our trees make guesses. And then we're gonna average up these guesses and we're gonna see how close it is to the actual truth right here. We're gonna be like, okay, wait a minute. A bunch of guesses are gonna work better than one single guess. So it's a bunch of trees working together instead of one tree. And we can see this with this example right here that if I were to ask everyone, what time is it right now? You'd be like, oh, 1028, 1035. I mean, you probably all have a clock right there. I looked and cheated and saw it's 1031. But people's guesses, if we average them, would probably do a pretty good job. Like one person could be really high, one person could be really low, but we're gonna have everyone work together. And this is the idea of a forest. So each tree makes a prediction, which is then averaged with the other trees. So all the trees work together to make one forest. It's literally what a forest is. So when we look at this right here, build a collection of partition models. Oh yeah, you're close enough so you heard it. I think I might've heard it out of the corner of my ears. So we have right here, each tree is gonna work on its own. We do have a thing called ensembling, but uh, we won't be doing ensembling. There is a carrot ensemble package, which is amazing. And it would kind of be the next step. And especially if you do like graduate work, carrot ensemble is amazing. So it's kind of the next step. It's like, now that we have all these models, let's have all these models work together. So let's take a look right here. When we look at our partition models, each individual tree has high variance. What does it mean for each individual tree to have high variance? That means that the data the tree makes the model from is going to kind of dictate it. That if we had a different set of data, we would see very different results. But with this right here, if we split the original data in half and fit the trees to both parts, the trees will almost invariably look very different. That's high variance right there. When the structure of the model depends strongly on the predictors, the particular data, that's high variance. Both trees' predictions will stay usually be will still usually be similar somewhat, but there's a potential for a lot of difference. So you can see high variance among the trees, which means you're seeing this, where some things could be very far off, and you're gonna see this greater variation among the trees, but averaging, averaging them together is what makes it all work. Now, this is the last key term I think we really need today is what's called bagging. So the idea right here is we're making bootstrap training samples. So these are the key steps. This is the last thing you need to write down, especially for notes today, is that we are going to take a random number of training rows. Keep picking rows until this bootstrap training sample has the same number of rows as the original data. This was in one of your previous assignments, so you should have a decent idea what bootstrapping is right now. What is a bootstrap sample? Please take a note, and then we're gonna look at our model here in a moment. Our model should be done. Please tell me it's done. Good, it's done. I was like, if that's not done, we got problems. What is going on with a bootstrap sample right here? In a bootstrap sample, I need four students to say me right now. Who's gonna say, say me right now, get a thousand points. Force four students. First four students say me, get a thousand. Who's got it? And I'm, put, I'm gonna put your initials here. As long as you're okay with that. A, Y, M, C. Okay, everyone's saying me gets a thousand. <laughs> it's like, are you paying attention? A, W, and S, W, okay. Okay. So I'm going to make a bootstrapped sample right here of these rows. I'm going to make a bootstrapped sample. Here is a bootstrapped sample. You ready for this? This is a bootstrapped sample. It's an unlikely bootstrapped sample. But when you bootstrap sample things, you create as many samples as there are in the original data, but you sample the original data with what? Who's got that key word right there? You sample the original data with what? Yeah, <laughs> look right there, Andrew. <laughs> you sample the... <clears throat> you sample... Yes, exactly, Anisha. Thousand points, Anisha, you're right. You sample the original data with replacement. So that's a bootstrapped sample. This is a bootstrapped sample. So you can get things like this. So this will create... What it is, if you think about it theoretically, is you're treating your data like it's a population. Like a population you can just keep sampling from. And the percentages of individuals or like, cause you wouldn't have, this is IDs, but if you had like an observation, like four or five, you might have it a few times. Like if they're quantitative, they'll, they'll repeat generally speaking. Um, but you treat your sample like it's a population that has the percentages by which things occur. 
So by treating your sample like a population, you're saying, well, theoretically, if these numbers represent the proportion of time things occur, like um, an Andrew would occur 25% of the time, I would. it's theoretically possible to get four Andrews. Does that make sense? If an Andrew appears 25% of the time, then you could mathematically say the percent of time I would get four Andrews as my sample of four would be the following. It's just mathematically this. So there is the percent of time I would get four Andrews, theoretically speaking, if this represents is representative of the population. And this is a bootstrap sample because this is a theoretical sample of four Andrews that could occur given these population percentages. And that's the idea of bootstrap sampling. So once again, we don't have to do this. We just have to know what the concept means. So here, let's go back, 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 back. So fit your model on each of the bootstrap training. So this, each of these is gonna make their own model. Repeat, creating tons of bootstrap training samples, fit each model on each one and average together their predictions, boom. This is the trees working together. But here's the big thing. And like, if I can give you two huge notes on how boost, on how uh, random forest works. Random forests have three key aspects you should know instantaneously. If there's the three things you need to know about random forests, it's this. One, each tree gets random rows. Each tree gets random nose, rows via the what process. Each tree gets random rows based on the what process. Like the rows that are in each tree, like the observations. Hey, what's up, Tyler? Oh, thanks. Yeah, my sister even sent me on that. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Tyler. Tyra, so good to see you here. Kind of. It is on the training, but what process? What process? It is the training data, but how do we get the training data for each tree? Each each tree gets training data created from the what process. So each tree gets its own training data, which is going to make it the bootstrap process. Yep, yep, yep. The bootstrapping process creates each one of our, like, does that make sense? The bootstrapping process creates the random data which will make our tree, which is going to be the training data. It is the training data, but it's created through the bootstrap process, which allows us to resample things. And so the only other things we really need to know is that when we do this, it's going to do a validation for us. So it'll do an in the bag, out the bag validation. And that's what it's going to do right here. Not too much. I don't like questions on this. It's going to kind of do its on its own thing. And the last two things I want you to know. So it's going to do it without running that, the repeated K fold, because it does within the bag, without the bag on it. And when we do this right here, this is what we need to know. Is that each tree is going to use a certain amount of predictors. So not only do we use random rows, we use random predictors. So think about this just theoretically here for a moment. Each tree is going to use random predictors. So does that mean if you have a really good variable that that variable will be used in every tree? So each tree has a random subset of X's. So if there's a really good X variable, will that X variable be in every tree? If there's a really good X variable, will that X variable be in every tree? Like it's like, oh, this variable really explains it really well. Will that X variable be in every tree? Because we're gonna take a random subset of X's for each tree. So we take random rows, not really, you're right. We take random rows, each tree has random rows and has random X's. So what this does is it allows each tree to examine different X's and the ways different X's interact. So the trees are kind of searching through, be like, hey, wait a minute. Now that we only have these five X variables, let's try to see how they work. And then wait a minute, now in this tree, we only have these five X variables. Let's see how they work. And then let's use another random five with another random set of data. So each tree is unique and we grow each tree to the maximum extent. So each tree is grown to the maximum extent. And then we're going to average together all the predictions it would make if an individual ran through the tree. So when you think about this, it's going to over a thousand points right there. So we literally overfit every tree, Sarah, we literally overfit every tree. And it'd be like this. It'd be like me asking everybody to like predict down to like this, the millisecond what time it is. I mean, that's not really overfitting, but it's like you're asking for something too exact from this. But then you don't look at that one prediction. 
you look at all the predictions from every tree. So you wouldn't be like, let me just look at the one prediction that's too exact. Let me average together all these too exact predictions. That's where the, the trees work together to make the forest. Each tree is insanely overfit. Any tree is a horrible prediction. Like if we were to do it for everything. But then all the bad predictions come together to make a great prediction. It's so like, what? What you're telling me, like you make trees that are way too overfit. And then you use those overfits to figure out what's going on. And it works. It works really well. Boosted trees and, uh, excuse me, random forests and boosted trees are amazing. The predictions are almost always more accurate and quite, uh, quite substantially amount when you compare a tree to a forest. So forests, each tree in a random forest is horribly overfit. We just said that. The trees fit the bootstrap data perfectly. So once again, why do they fit it perfectly? Because they're grown to the maximum extent. The trees are going to the maximum extent, so they're going to be fit perfectly to the training data, and they're horribly overfit, but then they all work together. In the random selection of predictors, uh, contains none that have any information about why, then a rule base, yeah, we don't, don't worry. Can we look at the code for each? You bet. And that's what we're going to see. I think we just saw all this, and let's look at the variable importance. So let's go back to R now and talk about this. Now that we have... Now that we have a kind of basic understanding of what's going on right here, let's look at, because I think we've stored some of these in. So this right here, I mean, say I'm trying to make sure like, because now that we've got it, we can see the answers. And looking at, what do you guys want to talk about first right now? Do you want to talk about the forest or the uh, gradient boosted? RF or GBM? RF or GBM? I'll kind of look at the enough people right now i can just look at the answers rf or gbm which one of these results do you want to look at because we've got them both right here forest okay so we'll go up here to random forest i think it's previous one here's the random forest and okay people are saying random forest because we just talked about that so recency is pretty good and i want you to look at right here we're just uh we're not changing the number of trees i guess we could go here i think it's n tree go here and go to 100 500, there we go, that should do it. Does it like it? Oh, wait, wait, is it I make a typo on it? Entry not found, oh, ha, ha, ha. Got a little too quick. There we go, there we go. Ooh, 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 stop. There we go. Parameter grid, what does it not like about the entry? Let me go look at the forest grid real quick. If you do not name your tuning parameters correctly, everything explodes. If you do not name your tune commerce correctly. This is the random forest, right? There are defaults for them. Method weight. GLM. Let me look up one thing real quick here in the background. Because it should be. I thought it was in is it gonna be entries? It's always Wait, two prior grid should have should have columns M try. Does have M column. It's not letting me tune the tree. They're in a forest. Let me check one thing. Probably could tune the trees. RF in carrot package. Rainforest tuning carrots. It's only letting you tune the M try, which is the number of variables used. Huh. I thought you could tune the trees and not say that too. They're only choosing, changing the M try right here. And that's the number of predictors. So change number of trees in random forest in R. Here we go. Someone says, popular answers. In general, the more trees, your better results. However, the improvement decreases the number of trees increase. Random forests are ensemble methods. Yep, because they're all trees. No one's saying how to change the parameter, because I swear I've changed it. Carrot and random forest number of trees. Let me see here, expand grid. Well, 
force grid, M try. Yeah, no, that just changes the right here. So I thought we could change the number of trees. I'll look into that. So number of trees, I really thought we could tune on that. So what does M try do? This is going to try two predictors. This is going to try four predictors. This is going to try 17 predictors. And let me look at one last thing in the background right here. Please type in the chat if you have questions. Carrot methods. And let me go look at this. Well, that's not the page. I want the page that has the... Here we go. This page looks good enough. Trees. There's boosted trees. Extreme gradient boosting. So categorizing boosting. Bagged. Bagged logistic. Random forest. Here it is. So ordinal forest. Random forest by randomization. Was that a different package? Required packages. Oh, cool. Did I just like bag logistic? Oh my gosh, this is on here 150 times. So we, there's so many models. If you guys want to see what I'm looking at right here. Um, you can, you can usually control for that, but maybe I just dreamt it that I could control this with this one. But um, number of trees. So all these right here, so there's M final number of trees, but there's so many models that you can do, like literally the amount of different models right here you can do is just insanity. Um, so yes, there you can tune the number of trees, but apparently not with this one right now. Sorry about that. So I stand corrected and I'll need to look at the notes on that because now we got it right here. Okay, you can change the number of trees though. I know I've done it. It's just, uh, it's, it's, you know what's really funny? It's easier to do inside of a jump. <laughs> I know how to do inside a jump off the top of my head very quickly. So um, with right here, this random forest, and I think we've already fit it. So we've already fit it. What do we get right here? How many different models were we making? What is the importance equals true? That will put the importance out. The importance equals true. Where are you seeing that in the code? Importance equals which part of the code? Number three, I should not have. Which number three? It's in the caret file. Let me take a look. Data mining. Here we go. That should output the importances. So the importances, which really brings us back to Ahmed's question right here. With the importances, that is how important a variable is used throughout the tree. It's basically a weighted scale of how often it appears and how much, how basically, like literally how important it is throughout the tree. So we can look at these graphics here in just a second to see what variables were really actually used to make this model. So when we look at the importances right here, we can see what variables are actually going to be used. No, I was just saying that we got two models. Oh, we got, we got three models. You're right. We got three models right here, three separate models. And so we can get the importances out, which we should have. So let's hop back here. Am I going mod? Let's see, practice at 10, here we go. So when we do these random forests right here, <laughs> I do, I can't let it not be, um, I can't let it not be cleaned up. It's just like, it would drive me nuts. And so right here, we should be able to tell what is our best, see, here's a pretty easy test question. What is our best fit model? What is our best fit model? And we fit on accuracy, it looks like. Which I didn't think we fit on accuracy. We can get the ROC and all that good stuff out of here in a second. But what is our best fit model right here? Model one, two, or three? Model one, mm, wait, wait. I think it's that one. <laughs> it's everybody likes cleaning up code. Like, yeah, that's the thing initially, you're right. It's like you start like, you're just like, let me, let me fix this up right here. Let me get the way I like it to look. And are these models, um, what two models are basically the same right here? What two models are basically the same? We can test out this model compared to another model 
by going right here and comparing these two models and then dividing by the larger of the two standard deviations. And this is gonna be very small. It's a, it's a half a standard deviation, model two and three, Sarah, you're right. So these models right here are basically identical. And if you really wanted, you could try out different M try because if you plot this, the plot of this is gonna look kind of meh. Um, why do I say that? It's because the we only have three points on this. I think I'm on the line with it, right? Invalid graphic state. Can I not get the plot of it? Well, I'll be. It doesn't like it. The code just doesn't like me today. Sometimes code just does not work. Maybe it's because I overwrote it, but I thought we should be able to get a plot of the forest fit, but we don't. So yeah, 17 predictors is apparently not working well for it. Um, if you look at how many predictors we have, let's look at the train data. Oh, there's eight, there's 17 predictors. Why is there 17 predictors? Why, it says 18 right there. Why is there 17 predictors? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, I'll go through all the lines of code. And why is there, so, no, great question right there, Sarah. Thank you for asking. That's a, that's why I'm like, yeah, let's do that. Why is there 17 predictors right here? Why is there 17 predictors? There's 18, but why is there 17 predictors? We can use up to 17 predictors. Why is there 17? Because one of them's Y. The Y variable here being churn is one of these uh, predict variables in here. So one of them is Y. Yep, yep. So when we do, when we do two, four, and seven, so two, four, and 17, what does that two, four, and 17 represent? It represents every tree it makes when it does two and it makes the trees, which I think it makes 500 by default. I'm like thinking back through my head how the code works by default, um, which I wish I thought we could change that. I swear I wanna, I'm just gonna be like after this looking for how to change the number of trees. But when it makes the 500 trees, it randomly selects two of these X's each time. Every tree is gonna get two random X's when it tunes it to two. Does that make sense? It's gonna pick two random X's and it's gonna pick a bunch of random rows with with replication where it can repeat the rows and that'll be a tree it'll make a tree from that it'll grow it to the maximum and then it'll do this 500 times by picking two random variables and so you'll get a bunch of different trees based on you know only two variables only two axes which will grow that tree to the maximum does that make sense like every tree will have two axes when it uses m try two that's the number of predictors it will try when it goes through here and tries to like fit the trees it'll pick two random predictors going through here saying let's predict churn from two random variables and then it'll pick random rows by doing the bootstrap method where it's repeatedly picking some rows does that make sense right there who's got me on that it's like okay it's going to pick random rows with replication and it's going to pick two random variables to make each tree and it's going to make like 500 trees and it'll do the same thing when it does it with m try 4 and m try 17 with m try 4 it's going to pick four random predictors from here and then it'll make a tree from bootstrapped rows, which allow for replication in the rows. So you get random X's and random Y's or random like observations. So each tree is its own random tree. This is like, oh man, we got, we got no buttons to happen. But each tree is its own random tree. Every tree is a random tree with random predictors and random rows. Now, what's interesting is this one would not be random. This one right here, which worked pretty well, is not random because it uses all 17. So every tree is going to have all 17. We could switch it to be 16 and it'd be random X's because it would be missing one, but that's gonna use all the X's. That was the maximum amount we could pick. Um, set seed controls the randomness because once again, we're doing a random process. So how do we know if the predictors are good, if they were picked randomly? Uh, they're just randomly picked. Oh, and then, oh, well, that's variable importance. So here, we'll take a look at that here in just a second, Ahmed. Great question. Uh, we got Y tilde X comma data equals. And then the real change right here is going to be the RF. The interaction depth is a little similar to uh, the variables picked, but the interaction depth controls how big each tree is grown. And in a random forest, how big is each tree grown? In a random forest, how big is each tree grown? In a random forest, how big is each tree grown? It's grown to the absolute whatimum. Each tree is grown all the way. Each tree is grown to the very biggest it can grow. Every tree in the random forest is completely overfit and grown to the maximum. The maximum extent exactly. 
the interaction depth in a boosted tree controls how much we grow each tree and then we try to learn from that tree so we're like it my analogy for boosted models is like i give you uh one month to grow a tomato plant so i give you one month to, to grow a tomato plant and then i say you have to chop it down you have to you have to dig up the tomato plant and throw it away after one month now if you do this over the course of three years do you think you're going to get pretty good at growing that tomato plant like the knowledge you have from each tomato plant you grow will kind of go forward and help you grow the next tomato plant better. So that's a boosted model right there where you, you build a, you make a tomato plant and then you destroy it and then you make the next one and you destroy it and you make the next one and you learn from each tree as you do it. You learn from each tomato plant. That's a boosted model right there is that each tree lets you learn from it and you learn down the line and the quicker you learn is the shrinkage parameter. If you have a high shrinkage, you're learning quickly. If you have a low shrinkage, you're learning slowly. Exactly, knowledge is power. So when you think about this and how big you let that tomato plant grow. So the interaction depth is how big you're letting that tomato plant grow. Like you could say, hmm, I'm only gonna let that tomato plant grow like one little bit or I'm gonna let it grow 10 little bits. And what is the right amount of time to let it grow to learn how to make the best tomato plant? It all depends. But so that's how I think about like, we always make new ones exactly. <laughs> and so the method right here, this just controls, this is literally the most important change right here. Um, this controls what method you're doing. The RF stands for random forest, the GBM stands for gradient boosted, and the TR control equals fit control. That is set way earlier. We can view it right here and we can see how we're fitting this tree. We have the do the allow parallel, which is parallel processing. I do not know what trim is. Adaptive complete, don't know what that is. Bunch of things are set to defaults right here. So you can see a bunch of, I mean, there's so many settings in this, but we mainly use a lot of the default, the default settings. So this is everything, this is so much here. Let's run it by itself. Um, but here's the, wow, yeah, I, I, I know what some of them means, but I don't know what everything in that means because I've never looked at the fit control because there's there's so many things. Coding is so much. So we really just go with the classic settings with like, are we doing k-fold cross-validation? How many folds? Um, and so we just set it that way. The tune control equals uh, the forest grid. That's set right here. You have to set your grid. I swear I've seen us do trees before, but maybe I dreamed it up. The pre-proc center scale is going to make things z-scores. The forest fit results right here. This is just letting us look at the results, which shows us the accuracy, the kappa, the accuracy standard deviation, and the kappa standard deviation. And now we go down to the really interesting stuff. This line of code right here is going to find the best row. All it's gonna do is go into these results and just print the best row. It's important to maybe look at all your results, but this is just the best row. Now we get into this. Mean dollar sign churn equals equals predict for the holdout. Now what we have for this is this is a vector of whether or not someone churns yes or no's. Now this is a vector right here of um, our predictions of whether or not people churn. And let's take a look at this code. This code right here takes your model and the new data equals holdout. That's classic what it is there. And then this code right here is your actual. So what are we just checking right here? We're just checking to see if your actual is equal to your predicted. And then we're finding out on average, how often is your actual equal to your predicted. So all this is checking is a logical check, going back to the beginning code we practiced in this class, to see if your actual is equal to your predicted and the percent of time that those two are equal. So how accurate is it? That's a great question. Let's go back in time right here before I messed up the code. It is 95% accurate. And this is on the holdout. And remember, we had accuracy of 96% here. So we can see that we have an accuracy of 95%, an accuracy of 96%, and we only had a decrease in accuracy of about 1%. And we could take and subtract this from one. Can't do that, yeah. And we could do one minus this. Oh no, go over here. There we go. And the decrease in the accuracy on the holdout was only about 1% decrease. So that's really a very small change. Um, we can also see right here, let's do the post resample. What post resample does is it just does it for us because I think that's the exact same number. Um, if you're like, hey, I don't have the time to do this. Here's this number right here. And here's this. Now I don't have the time to do kappa. So the post resample is gonna get you kappa. And I, there is something in the caret package. What is it? 
I literally found this last night and here's the ROC of it. So that'll calculate the ROC, which is the percent of time the yes value gets the higher probability than the no value. What was it? Because I saw something and this will help for the take home. Oh, where is it? This is gonna be a really long way of finding it. It's, it's, a confus it's not a confusion matrix, is it? I sent it to someone last night and I was like, oh, that's a way better way of doing it. I probably need to update the notes and put that in there because Carrot has a way of doing it. Does anyone know, is the person in the chat here, I will give you 5,000 points. If you post the, the code I sent you last night, might, let me, let me find it. It's such a cool, whenever you do, so whenever you do the mean of a logical check, it returns the frequency. When you do the mean of the logical check, it returns the percent of time it meets that condition. So the mean of a logical check returns the percent of time it meets that condition right here. And let me find this really quick. Okay, got it, found the code I think. Okay, cool, okay. Okay, here's the code. Confusion matrix, it was, I knew it was that. There we go. And then we just need to take our our model name, drop model name. We've got hold out, hold out, and then hold out, and we are predicting churn. I think that's got it. Yep, there we go. This bit of code, I'll even drop it in the chat right now. Really awesome bit of code right here. So it's dropped in the chat for everybody for your take home. But this pretty much prints out everything. And I was just kind of looking around last night and I was like, oh, that's really great. It's a good bit of output. It gets you the confusion matrix on the holdout. So we're making predictions right here. And then we also have the actual. If you look at right here, you've got your predicted and then you've got your actual. The, t the only two things this takes in confusion matrix is what do you predict and what's the actual. I think it's weird that it does in that order, but this is the predicted and this is the actual. And I think everything is accurate right here. 95.07, that's what we've been seeing repeatedly, 95.07. So there's our accuracy, our kappa is 0.7797, which is the same thing right here. And right here, which is how much we do versus a random guess model, kind of the improvement over a random guess model. Even here in Nisha, we've got sensitivity, we got specificity, we got uh, positive predictive value, we got negative predictive value, we got prevalence, prevalence, I should know what that is, detection rate, detection prevalence, and balanced accuracy, all these things right here, so many things at just the click of a dial, even a 95% confidence interval for our accuracy. So you can get all these things right here. And it looks like we don't have AUC on here, which is kind of a bummer. Do we not have AUC? That's a bummer. But to get the AUC, just go here and run this code. Now we got AUC. So um, you've got, just got to, I wish they, I don't, they should add AUC to that. I mean, you could edit your confusion matrix code and get the AUC. And so we've now looked at this right here. You can look at the answers, the ones that are selected. We might've changed our models slightly there. So we might be getting slightly different answers. Here's with the GBM though. This is gonna be similar. Once again, we went through this code earlier. Please ask questions if you have it. With the GBM right here, here's our best GBM model. And we're gonna do some comparisons here in a moment. Now, if you look at that code I just put in the chat, watch this. All we're gonna do is we're gonna take that code and drop it right here. We're gonna change the name of the model because that's where we're making the predictions. We're using the holdout again. And I think that's it. There you go. Done. That was it. I just had to change the model. We were using previously, was it random forest? That's not what we called it, was it? We called it, what did we call that last model? Da, 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 da. Forest fit, forest fit. Forest fit. So the only thing that's changing right here is the model that's making the predictions. So either we use forest fit or we use the GBM model, the GBM fit. Really? There we go. Oh, what am I doing? What is going on, everybody? <laughs> GBM fit. Oh my gosh, GBM. I can't spell. Um, what is GBM for like RF is for the forest? Gradient boosted models, gradient boosted, gradient boosted. And so they're boosted trees, gradient boosted models. And then there's extreme gradient boosting, which we don't, it's just more tuning parameters, more, you can extreme gradient boost. And I'll probably mention those at the start of class next time, and we'll get into support vector machine, but extreme gradient boosting just allows for more tuning parameters. It's like, hey, you like tuning parameters? Guess what? With extreme gradient boosting, we don't just have a few tuning parameters. 
we've got tons of tuning parameters. So when you look at extreme gradient boosting, this should be extreme gradient boosting. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine tuning parameters. That's extreme gradient boosting. Yes, 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 yes. Let's do that because that's where we're going back to. So we have all of our results. And now let's look at the variable importance right here, which should plot good. And we should be able to plot it. Let me go grab the plot for that. It should just be, we'll plot it, make the nice plot for us. And let's talk about this done class. Why is it not liking it? It says invalid color state. Please tell me that that plot will work because I like the pretty plot for it. And it should just be, here it is. There is where we're going to get it to plot. So let's go back. Let's put in the code right here. And there we go. Plot that. And we've got a different model name. Invalid graphic states. If anyone else, oh, it's the color palette. I think I've seen this before. We don't need to plot it, but it's such a bummer. And I can show you what it would look like. Cool. Okay. When we are talking about variable importance right here, it's how much in kind of a weighted value a variable is used in the trees. So when we talk about the variable importance right here, either in a GBM or we talk about um, a forest, it's very hard for us to view a variable. Like it's hard to go in and look at your 500 trees or your 1000 boosted trees and to say, okay, what variable really played a role in it? But when we're talking about whether or not people churn, the most important variable that was showing up and explained kind of the most variance was total daily minutes. So, oh, it did? Without the top 10, it worked? Nisha, thank you so much. Wait, I did without top 10, top equals 10, it worked. It's just gonna change the amount it shows. So variable importance, if we change away the top 10, maybe put your code in the chat real quick in this show and we'll see what's going on right here. See, this only gives you the top 10 right here. It should, it should be able to, it looks more than the top 10, I swear. It looks to be doing a little bit weird things today, but the variable importance lets us know which variables are the most important throughout the trees as we build them. So why would you need this? Well, what if we're gonna use another algorithm? What if we're gonna use something like a support vector machine? What if we have tons of variables and we're like, okay, I wanna limit my variables. What variables seem totally useless? If this works, watch it work. Error, wait, oh, because of that. You see, I, it's the palettes. There's a way, yeah, it's, it's, it's what I could do is I could try to reset R real quick. Yeah, these are completely just useless variables. So when you think about this, you kind of go back to the drawing board here. Oh, no, no worries, Anisha. Like, it's just weird. Um, here, we'll look at this after class. We'll, when we start off stars here, I'll look at it. I'll, I'll be like, what's going on with the color palettes? Because I was like, this error I've seen is just like a graphical thing something happened with my color palettes and it's being like, no, can't display it due to color palettes. And in case anyone else gets this error, I'll be able to put it in the video. So we'll fix this error here in a moment. Coding has errors, who would have thought? But the, the variable importance lets you know that variables like total daily minutes and total um, evening minutes are the most important variables. And you can kind of look at a ratio to see how much more important certain variables are than other variables and kind of what to use if you make other models. So if you're going to make another model, you might be like, okay, wait a minute, let me kind of limit this. Like if I was to make a neural net, I might go and only take these variables right here for my neural net. Even that one might not make the cut, but these variables right here, I could then kind of eliminate down. And really the idea of model making is just searching and searching and searching and searching and searching and trying new things and trying different models and making an algorithm that works that then explains your data. So if you have variables down here that are kind of like, these are just kind of junk variables, uh, I would remove these variables right here. And it might be due to like things like the high multicollinearity, but even with our trees, the total day charge is just not, I don't know, we could look at it, but um, you know what we're gonna do real quick? We're gonna take a look at it by itself. I just wanna see uh, how that variable, you know what we could do? Watch this. 
let's do some really classic stuff. Let's do associate and let's go to churn is explained by total day charge. This is classic 320. It should work. Why to give me invalid graphic state? Really? Error in number of rows, wait. Data equals churn. Here, wait, train? What is going on? Y tilde X comma data equals. Is not total day charge? I am going mad, everyone. Total day charge. Let me try one last thing. GLM. Okay, that worked. I'll have to look at it. That is a, oh, maybe it can't do logistic because this is going to be logistic, so that might be it. And there's that. It is actually significant. That's interesting. Hmm. But the way in which the curve, it only changes at the very end to somebody being likely to churn. And I am interested in the total daily minutes over here. So it's just classic old simple logistic regression. Oh, you know what? Let's look at that. I think it's that's the issue. Yeah, that that makes total sense. Wow, we we didn't clean the variables. Five thousand points. This is a big issue of what right now, and I think we're about to see it. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. I should have realized by the variable names. And that's why the one variable plays no importance. It's a complete issue of this. And the answer is shown right in here. And the answer is shown right in here. And if we had cleaned our data, which this assignment didn't have us do, we would have we would have taken the variable out. And I'm guessing that the other variable has that role too. Does anyone see it besides me? This is why we probably should have, I mean, we definitely can remove it now. I'm 100, zero variance. Well, mm, not really zero variance. It's the other one. Because there's there's variance in this data right here. Duplicate variable. Yeah. And that's that's what this is showing right here. Um, and that's what this graphic is showing right here is that we have 100% um, of the variation in this variable is explained by this variable. And so it's just a duplicate variable in the data set. And we could also show this by going to um, but up, but up, but up, but up, but up. like there's a lot of ways to show it. I'm gonna try this right here real quick. Let's go to train and go to the columns and concatenate. I think this will work right here. We're just gonna concatenate the names of them. Yeah. Oh, wait. Oh, it's standardized or something. It's 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 not the same. It's uh, been standardized by some metric, so it's not identical, but it's it's standardized by some metric, and so now if we did this right here, let's just I don't know I'm having fun with this for a last second here. We call this a data frame, and then we go data frame. So we go uh, data frame row column three divided by data frame column two divided by data frame column three. What is the ratio of it? Oh wait, no, okay. What? Can I have to pull the, the columns? There's that. Yes, it's, so it's duplicate information. This is the end of class right here. <laughs> Let's go here to vector one. Oh, I know why. There's two. What am I doing? That's why I was out of. Yeah, but I want it the other way. I want to do the big number and small number first. And it's always. Whoa, but there is. Is there? It looks like decimal differences. Like there's. If you notice, it carries to the 5.888. So they just did some rounding calculation on it. And it's virtually identical. So that's got it. Let's, we're gonna figure out that graphical error with the plot. I don't know if anyone else is having that. So initial, let's take a look right here. This is the end of class. We went through some results today. We talked about two different models. I know it's weird. So this total daily minutes, total daily, okay, yeah. So the total daily charge is based on based on the total daily minutes. Everyone, 
if people had different rates of charge, then that'd be different. Did I change anything about that code? <laughs> did I change, did I change anything about that code? This is the fun of, uh, <laughs> you know, cause I, I was like, what if I just run it? You don't, you don't want to show me top five? You don't want to show me top five? It doesn't like that top argument anymore. Let me look at that. I know, right? <laughs> Silly coding can go some days. <clears throat> As you can run it and you can just be like, you know, it, it just works or it doesn't work. Is there no top? Because yeah, it's not showing it. Look at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's supposed to show the top ten but the code doesn't want to do what the code wants to do. And I don't think we have a GLM stored. Oh, we do. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. What did I put differently? Can you not do it for the GBM? What did, what did, what, what, what? Let me look at my code here that didn't run it. Okay, okay, so this code has to be wrong right here. Where did I put the comma wrong spot or something? Okay, it has to be out, it has to be in the plot. It's not within the ver imp. Um, okay, so that's what it is. So this was in the wrong spot. This has to be in ver imp. There we go, there we go. Yeah, let's do that, let's do that. So this is at the end of the video now. Um, just I'll show off the answers right here. Let me hop and show the answers. I said I would help out big time. So the answers are at the very end of the video. Let's show the answers. They are recorded right now. Here, let's show the answers. The accuracy of the naive model on the holdout. So how do we do, I'm gonna just ask some small questions right here, going to the theory of this. How would we look at, was it missing parentheses? Oh, did I not, two seconds. Did I not, uh, don't be weird now, computer. Yeah, I had to like miss parentheses, missed parentheses there. Um, the accuracy on the holdout is we look at the what for the training data and find the what. So how do we find the accuracy of the holdout? We need to know the what. I think I might have corrected. If we're trying to predict something that's categorical, see what the majority level is. Yep, bingo. So whatever this is the percent of the majority level on the holdout. So this is the percent of the majority level, which I think we're predicting churn. So we can figure out this one pretty quickly by going here and just doing a table of the holdout, which as long as our holdout is made correctly, and then we can divide by number of rows in holdout. Let's see if we have the same holdout. And then you can just times this by 100. And there it is right there and round it, or it wants it as 0.8. Ooh. I think our holdout is made differently. So let's add another answer here and not a number. So this right here, you know what it is? It's probably the um, randomness again. Once again, the randomness comes back to jump on us 0.8526. So 0.852. Randomness is not our friend this semester. And so that has that. Um, did anyone else get a different majority level in their holdout? Because I could, let me look at that real quick. So the answers are all in here. It's due tomorrow night, so I think we should be good. Let me go to where the holdout is made. And let me, you know, we can get that code pretty quickly again. And let me change the randomness procedure making the holdout. So the where the holdout was made. And here is where it's made. So let's go here and go to um, RNG kind and go to sample and go to rounding and there's that, and let's grab this code. And 85.44, was that the one we got? Oops, there's the next one. So the accuracy on the holdout, 85.44. See, that's doing a little bit different. Don't tell me they updated this again. And now let's look at the accuracy on the holdout. 
84.64. There it is. There's the 84.64, which was the original answer. And it looks like this is using rejection. So very sorry, very good that that's in there. Both answers are in there right now and they've got some margin of error, but 84.64 is the answer that was first in there. And we have confirmed that by doing a uh, sample RNG kind rejection. So that is in there right there. And then so that question update. And the next one right here, the probability that the specified individual will turn, read off the decision tree in the appropriate terminal uh, partition. So this is interpreting a tree and going down the uh, section of a tree. So anything we do, so here's the correct answer. Please note, the answer is in the video right now. So please enter in this answer. When we look at a tree, we talked about this last class. So which one is this? This is question 1E. Let's go to 1E and let's look at it. Okay, so we need to view the tree and we need to go through it. And hopefully my tree has been created similar enough to this. Oh my gosh. Now the way to view the tree, so that is the probability of yes, because mm -hmm, we're predicting the level of interest. And we're gonna save this as a PDF. This is the best way to view trees. And you have to put about the same dimensions and we're gonna call R plot nine. So let's go R plot nine. There it is right there. And so you can zoom in on it now. It's a little easier to read. And the way you do the predictions right here is when we predict whether or not somebody will churn, we have to ask ourselves, what are the, what is their total minutes? What is their total minutes? Now this individual right here, and we might get a slightly different prediction because we might have a slightly different tree because I might not have used the right randomness procedure. Um, the individual in this tree, where are they? Da, 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 da. Prediction, total minutes less than 254 and voicemail plan, yes, okay. So they have total minutes equal, oh, you see, we're getting a different tree. Uh, churn just means they leave their cell phone carrier. So churn is an industry term to mean leave their cell phone carrier. So when someone's contract comes up, they leave their cell phone carrier and it's called churning. So they, they leave, so it's synonymous with they did not renew their cell phone contract. So if someone churns, they did not renew their cell phone contract. Does that make sense right there? For somebody to churn, they did not renew their cell phone contract. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rerun this tree. Good questions, Adam. Yeah, now feel free to ask. Be like, what does, what does churn mean? What does that mean? Oh, it's gonna be a little tiny writing down here. 265, is that the right number we should be getting? 254, oh, tree, don't do that. Did all that? Okay, I don't think I ran it. I mean, I did run it. Really, the tree's gonna turn out differently. Visualize tree. And let me export. Export to PDF, 12, 10, R plot seven, priority, oh, R plot seven, oh, R plot seven, and 265. I'm getting slightly different numbers in the tree, but with this right here, the most important thing with making your predictions in the tree is like, let's say Brian has a total minutes of 240. Would Brian head left or right if Brian's total minutes is 240? Would Brian head left or right if Brian's total minutes is 240? Brian has 240 total minutes. Would he head to the left or to the right? Which way does Brian head when he goes through the tree? To the left, yep. Because this is my total minutes are less than 265 of 240. So we would then go down to this node right here and we'd say Brian has never called customer service. At this point, you have to remember that this is the yes side and this is the no side. Since Brian has never called customer service, he would head to the left. So Brian's gonna head to the left because he's never called customer service. Does Brian have an international plan? Now here's where it gets really confusing. Brian does not have an international plan. So would Brian head to the left or to the right? Brian does not have an international plan. Would Brian head to the left or to the right? Brian would head to the left because this is an answer yes to this question. It's not international plan yes, it's Brian does not have an international plan. The answer to that question is yes. So that's where I think people get confused <clears throat> because even though this says international plan, no, going to the left means we answer yes to the question, not to international plan. But the question is, does Brian not? The question is, does Brian not have an international plan? The answer is yes. Brian does not have an international plan. So Brian's predicted probability of churning, which I think is actually close to the answer, 
Um, Brian has a 4.6% probability of churning. Brian's probability of churning is 4.6. And so, yeah, well, there we go. 4.6, there's the answer. If you're getting something slightly different, don't don't worry. Uh, the randomness procedures are driving me absolutely maddening. And I think Jordan had a question about three. Is it three on this? Let's hop down to it. Um, so that question should be good there. The value of M try in the random forest with the lowest estimate. I think we found seven for this, was it? How many was it? It was the nine? Two? Wait, there we go, four. There we go, it was four. I thought it was the middle one. So we did do this one actually. We did 100% complete this one and this is the number of variables that were tried. So you should know what M try means when you see this. Oh, I skipped one. Dun, dun, dun. Thank you, Jordan. A uh, thousand points, Jordan, right there. The AUC of the holdout sample on the optimized vanilla partition model. Note, because we are tuning models based on accuracy, your fit control, yep, make sure you have that fit control. Use the ROC control right here. So we need the um, the AUC on the holdout sample of the optimized vanilla partition model. So the optimized vanilla partition model is just going to be this right here. So we do have this right here, and we should get the AUC, and it should be 8 0.8671. 0 0.8671 should be. Let's hope. Let's cross our fingers. It is not. Why is it not? I wonder if. Let's try something right here. Let's try. You know, we're gonna we're gonna put in a chunk right below. And I'm gonna try two things. I'm gonna go here because I'm gonna see if it's the randomness. And so you're right. Look at the response sections. Yeah, it's like right there. <laughs> Cause and here's the thing. I want to see. Let me do this right here. I'm gonna put this as the last code we run so we can just see that. Okay. So now we're gonna run all this code here again. Just take a second, let it run. And we're gonna look at the ROC right now, and then we're gonna look at the ROC. Um, so let's see, here's the ROC, 0.8828. Now we're gonna to go to the RNG kind, and we're gonna change it to rounding. And that'll run, wait, wait, is that where I changed it? No, not, let's put it all the way here at the start. And that's right before the there. So that should help that. And then let's run all the code. Wait. There's that. And then. Did I skip? I thought I had a chunk right after this. Oh, wait, is this vanilla logistic? Wait, there's the accuracy on that. We're doing the partition model, right? Okay, good, good. Here it is right here. Okay. So I think I have rounding in there right now. And let's see, and, and this is the answer right here. I just want to confirm the answer. I want to show, and I want to see if it is, which one it is. Oh, I saw something. There it is. So maybe we needed the whole time. Um, this is what drives me mad right here is, I don't know when they changed this in R, but, um, oh, that's the second time I put it in. So I have this here on the first, I have this here on line 35. So if you're running into these errors, and now I think our tree will actually be made correctly. Yeah, you can see it if you look really closely. That, that says 254. So now the tree is actually made properly, and the RNG kind is actually that. Please tell me if you have any issues with this. I do understand it's kind of maddening, but for some reason they updated it, and maybe it like resets the RNG kind. So I don't know why, because it's like, oh, you shouldn't use rounding, and it's like it just changes it on you. So now we are getting this exact answer right here. And we could use the confusion matrix. So the confusion matrix, once again, which I kind of like, the confusion matrix in caret right here, it's going to take basically these same arguments, but in a reverse order, I believe. So let's just take these arguments. And there we go. Um, it won't matter. I, I'll look at either result. You know, like I know it's odd to say it won't matter because it's just like the way the randomness is done. So, um, let's all like, all like this. There we go. Um, and then let's look at those. So either way, I'm fine with either way. And this is on the holdout. There we go. There's the accuracy. Estimated accuracy on the holdout. It doesn't give you AC though. Estimated accuracy. And yeah, it's on the holdout. Select CP. And the CP is, yeah, there we go. Oh, we got to talk about complex grammar next time. It's just, yeah. Oh, yeah, because, so we got a few more topics to finish up next time, but we've covered a lot today, and we did a lot of output. Today was a very good coding day. 
few times I even I went mad. And then the last one right here. So all these answers are in the video. Uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da, update that question. And then the value we did that, it was four. The estimated accuracy when generalizing on of the optimized boosted tree, once you have run train, left arrow, the object created to GBM fit, you will get this. So you can look at this right here. This is the estimated accuracy, which means it's how it does on the validation. That looks to be the answer. Let's see, am I getting the same answer? Let's take a look. Oh, do I not have? Unexpected. I've got something extra. Oh, it's that? What was that doing there? So estimated accuracy right here. And there it is right there. I think that's what Andrew put. Now mine's slightly different. Is the margin of error within that? That is the answer. And it's probably in the notes too, but probably what happened here is once again, I was changing them around my GBM. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I was like, I was like, no one should have problems with this. The answers are basically there and it shows you all the code. And it looks like my randomness procedure is a little bit different right now. Let me go down here to the GBM fit and let's just run that in the background here. Did I change this? Ooh, ooh, ooh. look at this right here. Um, didn't I add in 20? I added in 20, which is changing. I think it was 10. And so unfortunately now we're going to have to sit through that again. So right here, um, because I added in another um, min observations per node, um, that probably changed the answer. And so unfortunately we have to sit through the GBM again because Brian was changing around his code. We do right here. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll probably do some later in the day office hours and I can answer questions right now. What questions do people have right now? What questions do people have right now? What are people working on? What are you thinking of? Take a break here in a little bit, get some lunch. Could you go over the programming section of the homework in the office hours? I'm having some trouble. Yeah, which which section of the, feel free to ask right now, Jordan, which, which thing are you working on? Which part of the code for which question? I'll start pulling that up right here. Let's start talking about that. Which thing are you thinking about? Because this should be all the boosted trees and all that good stuff, tree-based models. Okay, let me, everything should be downloaded. Cool, okay. How's the boosted trees done? Okay, let's see. Confusion matrix, oh, we just need to look at this, right? And there it is, boom. So that does confirm the right answer right there. Once again, if you remember all the way back, we had a slightly different, well, there's the accuracy right there after I ran it. Here's the accuracy here, and here's the accuracy here. And wow, it looks like it's very similar. And I'm wondering where the difference was, but it was just because there was a different number of min nodes, which it still got the same answer, but it was just a later model, which that's so interesting that the results change when you change the amount of models it looks at. Um, correct, I believe so. If you're having any issues with it, Sarah, please contact me. Um, contact me and be like, hey, Brian, here's what I'm working with. Remember, don't send anyone else questions. You got it, Sarah. Um, creating the improvement function. Yes, let's look at that. Let's take a look right here. So let's look at improvement. Write a function called improvement that takes two arguments. So we have a partition it's gonna take, a data frame, whose first column is the Y variable, numeric, and whose second column is the numeric X variable. So when you think about this right here, um, be very careful. Um, be careful if you're writing things I write because I kind of do some notes for myself. I don't, hopefully the grader's been nice on all these things. But what we have right here is a data frame and we're just kind of visualizing what it should take. So the first thing it's gonna be is a data frame. That's what this partition thing's gonna be. And the first column Y should be numeric. So Y is gonna be something like this right here. And then the second column um, is numeric also. So we've got X right here. And this is also some sort of numeric column right here. So this is what it should take as an object. Did I make a mistake? There we go. And so this object right here is what it should take. Does that make sense, Jordan? Is this is the type of object it's going to take when we do this work right now. We'll take a data frame, 
with two numeric columns in it. So we can see right here our data frame whose first column y variable is numeric and whose second column is numeric also. Makes sense what we got. Threshold, the threshold for a rule. So if x is less than or equal to the threshold versus if, if x is greater than or equal to the threshold. So all this is just some value which we're gonna say we need this amount of return right here. The function should return the fraction reduction SSE when the individuals in the partition are split with the rule that uses the provided threshold. So here we are. Recall that the fraction reduction SSE is our original SSE minus the standard errors within each group divided by the original standard error. Okay, so what do we have right here? SSE original is the error within the original Y value. So now we need a way of calculating the SSE original. To calculate the SSE original, all we're gonna do is take all of our Y so we need to go to our data frame, dollar sign y, and then we need to go the, the distance it is away from the what. We wanna find the distance it is away from the mean, and that's just the error. And what do I need to do to find the SSE? What do I need to do to find the SSE? And this will be the SSE original. What do I need to do to find the SSE original? What do I need to do to find the SSE original on this? Like how would I, this is just an E right now. That's a hint right there. This is just an E. This is not an SSE yet. How do I find the SS for this? How do I find the SS for this? What would I do to the error right here? Because this is just an error. And I could do it in multiple steps. I can just call it an error. Yep. And then I, but before that, I think you got it. Oops. Oh, and we won't square root it yet. Um, because this won't be RMSE, this will just be the sums of squared error. Does that make sense? Because this is going to be the SSE, which is the sum of the squared error. So we won't do an RMSE, which is the typical miss the model makes, or the, the root mean square error. This will be the sum of the squared error. So we will sum these squared errors. Yep. And so this right here is going to be the SSE original. Ah, went wrong way on that one. So this here is the SSE original. But then we need to see when we partition the data, which I think the question maybe walks you through this. Um, when we partition the data, we're going to make a sums of squared error for um, the first and a sums of squared error for the second. Let me just look at the threshold real quick. The threshold, the threshold for a rule x is less than this versus x. Yeah, okay, cool. So now when you look at my values of the x's, eh, we'll do them in order. So my values for my x's, are like this. So do you see my values for my x's? If x is less than or equal to a value, it'll go to the left-hand side. If x is greater than or equal to a value, it'll go to the right-hand side. So we're gonna create splits right here. And so what we need to do is we need to make what's what's. We need to make two what's for our data. We need to make two what's for our data here. We need to make a group of the data for this, and we need to make a group of the data for this. I mean, that's just one spot I could split, but we're gonna make two blanks for this data. We're gonna make two somethings for this data. Partitions basically in subsets. Exactly, Jordan, great job. We're gonna make two subsets here. So we're gonna go to subset, or we can call this, uh, let's call this sub.1. And we're gonna go here to subset, and let's subset our data such that um, we need to subset what data? We need to subset the data frame. And the data frame is going to have the condition that x is less than or equal to, and I think that's what it said, right? Less than or equal to, got it, threshold. Now, we don't have threshold stored in here yet, but we can. And let's make sure we spell threshold the way it wants it spelled. We kind of did. Threshold is going to be 9. So we're now going to create a subset here. And then we could do subset 2 where x is greater than the threshold. So now we have two subsets, subset two, subset one. Does that make perfect sense right there? I've got two subsets. And from here, we're almost there because now we just need to find the sums of squared error for the subsets. What line of codes will I be using again right now, but altering slightly? What lines of code will I be using here, but just altering slightly? What lines of code will I be using between these but altering just, just just very slightly. What lines of code will I be using here to find the errors in the subset, but just alt altering slightly? To find the within partition errors. 
What lines of code will I be using? Any ideas? I'll be using these right here. So watch this, you ready? I'm gonna go right here, and I'm gonna put that line of code there, and I'm just gonna change this from here to here to here. And now I have the error within this partition. Ooh, I did not wanna overwrite that. <laughs> there we go. And now I grab these lines of code, and yeah, that'll be SSC2, and that'll be sub2, and that'll be sub2. And as long as I haven't copy pasted the wrong thing, we now know our SSC1 and our SSC2. And there we have everything we need for all of our SSEs, and we have them in different parts. So this right here creates original SSE and threshold someone picks. And this right here subsets data. And yeah, I should do them in the afternoon too. I should do them around four or five, I think so. Definitely, Brad. That's a good idea. I like that idea, Brad. Definitely. And good luck in the class, Brad. It's so crazy. It's so much awesome. You're welcome, Brad. Thank you guys. Thank thank you everyone who shows up and kind of works through the code, practices it. That's what it's all about. And there we go. Oh, we're getting a minus? Uh-oh. Let me see what's going on right here, because we shouldn't get a minus. SSC original, two. Hmm. That's interesting. Two. Well, how are we getting two right there? That should cause a reduction, or this should be zero. Did I not? The sum of the squared error. That's the mean for the subset. Let me look at this. It's like a paradoxical thing that I've never seen before. And so, let me look at how this was. <laughs> well, I made a mistake apparently, I think somewhere. Okay, wait, okay, wait. Yeah, the, it was, it was a, there we go, there we go, there we go, there we go. Okay, yeah, it's, it, there was no mistake, I just, I overwrote something at one point because I was like, you can't have a negative reduction. There's no way you can split and get a negative reduction. If you split, it's only going to improve the tree. So you you can't theoretically get a negative. And I was like, did I figure out something you can't do? So when it didn't make sense, I was like, I have to have done something wrong. And I think it was at one point I overwrote my SSE original with my SSE one. It was way back here. I overwrote SSE original with a yeah, here's where I did it right here because I did it for the subset. So that's why SSE original had two in it. When I looked at it, I was like, was it two originally? And then I went and re just recalculated it up here. So if I run this, everything runs and I get that right there. Now that's the reduction in the SSE. And I want you to just think about this. The SSE was 10 and the SSE is now um, 2.5 when you add these two together. So when you compare this, you get seven over 10. So 7.5 over 10, excuse me. So you get 7.5 over 10, and from here, it's just kind of turning it into a function. But um, how does that look right there, Jordan? Does it, I think it walks you through everything. Like it, it explains every kind of step by step by step by step by step. And then it has you use like this data frame right here, but um, you just put in your arguments, and this is the data frame it's using, and this is this right here. And we should be able to, I'll do this real quickly right here. What we should be able to do, because we used a lot of similar notation, is we should be able to take, and you know what we can do? So we can go here, drop this into here, and we called this df. Uh, so wherever we see df, here, match case, um, let's call df data, not that, and replace all. And then I think we're good on threshold because I just replaced everything and called everything data right here. So it's data Y, da 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 da. And I think everything in down here is called the Y var. It's called Y var. That could cause an issue. Well, let's just call it Y var. It had to be called Y var. You know what you can do? Here's a better way. Yeah. 
No, nah, it's going to cause more problems. We'll just call it a Yver. This is the only thing that's going to cause an issue is the is that Xver. And that's Yver. And that's Yver. And did I miss any? Here's Yver. And that's Xver. And that's good to go on that. And then we need to go here. And we need to put this inside of a return. And we go here. Okay, I think that's got it. And now we need to go here, put in data, remove out threshold. And we can go here and threshold stored to the global environment. So I should be able to call it threshold. There we go. So it's stored to the global environment. We'll just set threshold equal to five by default. Um, I don't know if it says put a default. Okay, that might work. I don't see an error I've done yet. Um, yeah, there's data. Yeah, we could do it. We got it. There we go. That's got it. Um, if you notice, once I created the function, I made it work on a data set. So once again, um, it's always easier to make a function that works on something to like make it work and then, and then to just substitute in the variable names. And I did have to make some changes to this because this is called yver. And in truth, if the first column here is the y, you could do that. That should still work 100%. Oh, 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 what did I change and what did I, oh, I have a dollar sign there, yeah, okay. And that's still working. I'm just making small changes. And this is where the mean, okay, that'll work. It's the mean of the y there, so that's the first column. And that's the first column here. That should still work. This is the y variable right here. This is the y variable right here. This, this one I'm thinking, I don't know how to change that. Hey, what's up, Ahmed? Sure, feel free to ask a question anytime, man. Anytime. Okay, that all worked. We haven't broken the code yet. How do I make a subset on X2? Yeah, here's a, so I can fix this so that it does it on the variable. Let me change this code. I don't have to, but I'm just doing it because I want to. Data, and then we need to go to x2, which is the x variable, greater than threshold. So that'll look into the data column, and cool, that does that. And then we go to which, and... There's the which, that returns the positions. And then we want to go to data. And we want to go, was it greater than? Yeah, it's a great one. Um, and then we want to go to the rows of this right here. So I'm subsetting based on that now. So this is a subset still. And we're going to go here to this code and we want to do less than or equal to. And then, is there a difference between a regression tree and a boosted tree uh, parameters? So the regression tree is a quantitative tree and a boosted tree is a tree that learns from additional trees. So gradient boosted trees have the four parameters. They have shrinkage. They have a number of min nodes in bios, um, number of min observations in node, <laughs> number of min observations in node. Um, it's such a weird like shortening of the words. Um, they have interaction depth. And why am I not thinking of the last one? Interaction depth, number of min observations in nodes. They have um, shrinkage, which is the learning. And then they have, I'm trying to think of the numbers and how they look. I could cheat. Let's cheat real quick. You guys get a note card, so I get a note card every once in a while. Um, so when you talk about a boosted tree, there we go. Uh, entries. That one does have entries. That one's the number of trees you're going to learn to learn from. So a regression tree is just a quantitative tree. When we're talking about a regression tree, a regression tree is just a quantitative tree. That's all the regression tree means. And so you can have a regression tree that is a boosted tree. You can have a classification tree that is a boosted tree. So when you say regression tree, that's just terminology that the Y is quantitative. When you say boosted tree, that's a gradient boosted model, which has the four tuning parameters as shown right here. So the terminology regression tree, um, so a regression tree can be a boosted, like a regression tree can be a type of gradient boosted model because gradient boosted use trees and regression trees are quantitative wise. Does that make sense, Ahmed? Does that help make sense of what that means right there? The subtle differences. And did I break it? I broke it. It's gotta be this code. Oh, columns, haha. -ha. I don't know rows and columns is the issue. 
Da, 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 da. The reason I did this is I don't want to name my variables in this. Yeah, that was it. So, so if it's not boosted, that means there's no tuning parameters. Um, if you're boosting a forest, yeah, there should be no boosting parameters for the trees. Just a kind of vanilla tree model will not have uh, tuning parameters. We do, actually, I stand corrected. We optimize the CP and we try different values of CP. And I should have mentioned that. I'll mention this tomorrow. Sorry about that. The CP is the complexity parameter. Let's go back and look at CP real quick. It's where we ended class yesterday. And then I jumped into activity today and I didn't talk enough about CP. So the CP right here, which we should see CP in just a second. Where is complexity parameter? There's the complexity parameter right here. So the CP is how basically big we are growing the tree, which I think I mentioned just briefly at the end of last class. So the CP right here is how we are tuning our tree. And our goal is to have the highest accuracy. We're tuning on accuracy. And the complexity parameter is the return, which is so interesting you bring this up now because that's what this question is getting at is how much return are we getting? So if you have a very high complexity parameter, your model is saying, I need a very large return to split the tree. If you have a very low complexity parameter, you're saying, I don't need much to split the tree. I only need the model to improve this tiny amount. So which of these trees are more likely to make to be bigger trees? When you say the model has to give me a large return or when you say the model has to give me a small return, which of these are likely to be very large trees? When you say my model needs to give me a big return for me to split or the model only needs a tiny return. Ah, it's when there's only needed a tiny return. It's kind of counterintuitive because you're saying if I get a little bit of improvement, I'll let the model split. That's what a tree down here says. It says, if there's a tiny bit of improvement, we will split. Is there a tiny bit of improvement again? Split again. Is there a little bit of improvement? Split again. Now, all the way up here at the higher complexity, the model says, I need a big improvement to split. Like I need a reduction in the Gini coefficient by this amount. I need a reduction in the SSE by this amount. So that's what you're seeing right here with these calculations is in this, we are seeing an improvement of 98%, which would definitely have a split. I mean, I don't, can't imagine. But um, that right there is going to split, and I can, I'm looking at the data. Yep, I can see how it would work. Yep, because it's the last few numbers. It's splitting this right here and splitting this off. You got it, yeah. So the complexity parameter controls how much we need to improve the tree to make a split. And when we look at this right here, the amount of improvement would be very tiny because of the complexity parameter. Um, so these are often overfit trees, but this one's actually working. So the complexity parameter is the only tuning parameter, and we just put in values of complexity for it to try, as you can note, right, where's our uh, grid right here? Here it is. So we've got 20 different complexity parameters, and somewhere in here, um, a very low complexity parameter is very good for it. There's other ways to look at the output for this, like this right here, and here's the optimum complexity parameter, and we just kind of let it pick. So I'll have to mention that at the start tomorrow, and we'll finish up with support vector machines tomorrow on Thursday, on Wednesday, oh my gosh. Um, but does that make sense how the only thing we tune in the tree is basically how big the tree grows? The only thing we tune for each tree, for just a singular tree, is how big the tree grows. And this would be a regression or classification tree. So the only thing we tune is how big it grows. And if you notice right here, these are very large trees, and these are going to be very small trees down here, which are going to do towards the naive model. They kind of flatten out at the bottom. So overall, well, I think that's got it. We'll be back later today doing some more work. I'll be back. I'll see everyone later. Bye, everybody. Bye, Ahmed. Bye, Jordan. Bye, Brad. If you're still here, bye, guys. Bye. <laughs>